Warm welcome, Roadrunner family. I'm so honored and delighted to be here with you virtually at the Gender Matters Symposium because it offers a golden opportunity to recharge and find inspiration in a sisterhood of superheroes, one another. We know there is power in solidarity, in sisterhood, and we are emboldened and energized to effect change for the greater good together. As we listen to the powerful stories of our speakers today, we do so in a world that looks far different than it did last year. We know that women, particularly women of color, have been disproportionately affected by job losses, healthcare disparities, and other injustices during the pandemic. But for the first time ever, we also have a woman as the Vice President of the United States. It is a time of hope a time of challenge and a time of action for social justice warriors. When I was appointed the first woman president at Cal State Bakersfield, I was honored at the state capitol with a resolution that cited my fierce support of diversity. And I urge you to share your fierce support and be fearless in your journey. I wanna thank Dr. Salisbury, my friend, my colleague for convening this very special and important day of empowerment and action. Let us all commit today together to support and lift our sisters and to deeper dedication to equity, justice, and respect for all. Thank you. Thank you, President Zelazny. That was awesome as usual. Uh, President Zelazny has been uh, the opening remarks individual for each one of the gender symposiums that I have done. Um, and I greatly appreciate her presence being here. It's calming and it uh, kicks us off on a great start. Um, another traditional person who has been our opening remarks is um, uh, Dean Deborah Jackson, Dean of Undergraduate Education. Um, she is a founding faculty member of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. And she is a friend of mine, and I would love to hear her remarks for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Salisbury. I'm so very excited that we're celebrating the 13th annual Gender Matters Symposium. The theme this year is Women in America, What Do We Do Now? And I thought that I might take a moment to ask that question in a very local way. Women in Kern what do we do now? Um, in addition to my role as the um, uh, interim associate vice president for academic programs and uh, of academic affairs and dean of academic programs, I also sit on the vision committee for the Women and Girls Fund, which is a Kern Community Foundation initiative. And one thing that that initiative, uh, that the group, the Women and Girls Fund does is every um, five years, we issue a report on the status of women and girls in Kern County. We just released the 2020 report a few months ago in the fall. This report is commissioned by the Women's and Girls Fund at Kern Community Foundation, and it was prepared by the Center for the Advancement of Women at Mount St. Mary's University in Los Angeles. This report is important for helping us understand the status of women and girls and also thinking about how it's changing, whether the changes are positive or troubling. This report examines the status of women and girls across the county in terms of economic well being, family and homes, and health and safety, and the correlation of educational attainment of women to these issues. I've um, put the link here in case you would like to read the full report. You can find it at www.kernfoundation.org. Look under initiatives. You'll find the Women's and Girls Fund under the list of initiatives, and you can find links to both the executive summary of this report and the full report. Today, what I'd like to do is draw your attention to some of the highlights in this report to help us think about where women and girls are in Kern County, what women and girls are accomplishing, and what areas of need are emerging for women and girls locally. Let's first start with demo demographics. 
there are approximately 450,000 women and girls residing in Kern County. That's 49% of the total population. Latinas comprise a slight majority, 53% of Kern County women and constitute the youngest group in the county. Approximately one third or 32% of Kern women and girls are white. Between seven and 8% of Kern women and girls are of Asian descent and 5% of Kern women and girls are African American. In terms of education, Kern girls have a four year high school graduation rate of 90%. That's great news. Of course, we would like to see it at 100, but um, that is, I think, good news. And for African American girls, the rate has increased since 2013 uh, from 72% to 82%. And for Latinas, the rate has increased from 84% in 2013 14 to 90%. So one thing that we can conclude from this is that over the past five years, we have seen gains in terms of educational attainment for women and girls in our region. We still have more progress to make, but that is good news. 25% of current women have an associate's degree or higher, which is a slight increase from 22%. So that's good news, but of course we have a great deal of work to do in that area. What's troubling, however, is that half of Kern County women have a high school education or less, and that 41% of Latinas in Kern County do not have a high school diploma. We have work to do. In terms of employment and earnings, in 2018, the unemployment rate for Kern women aged 20 to 64 was 8%. 10% of Kern working mothers with children under the age of 18 were unable to find work. And something that we know that happens across the nation and doesn't seem to be making the progress it needs to is the pay equity gap. Kern women earn 83 cents for every dollar earned by a Kern man. Poverty rates are one of the deeply troubling areas uh, con concerning the status of women and girls in Kern County. 23% of women and girls in Kern County live in poverty. That's significantly higher than that for the state of 14% uh, in the state of California. Very startling, staggering, is that 28% of Kern children live in poverty compared to 17% for the state. 39% of current households headed by women live in poverty. I think that thinking about how gender matters and what we do now for women in Kern, I think tackling poverty is one of the key issues that we need to double down our efforts, begin strategizing and thinking about how we can take responsibility for improving the life lives of women and girls in our county. What we do know is that a Kern woman without a high school education is six times more likely to live in poverty than one with a bachelor's degree or higher. I think that what that tells us is that we as a university, as educators, um, have a responsibility to promote higher education among women and girls in our region. In terms of maternity, 4% of births were by teen mothers aged 15 to 19 years old, and 43% of current women giving birth are single compared to 32% for the state. I think what this tells us is that we need to support young women and all women who are new mothers to make sure that they have the resources they need so that they can uh, uh, um, uh, provide uh, well for their families. In terms of safety, this is another issue that I find very troubling. 
In 2018, there were 10,159 calls for domestic violence assistance. This is a two-fold increase from 2015 and approximately a 50% increase from 2017. Clearly, violence in the home, violence in families, interpersonal violence is a significant issue that affects the safety, health, and well-being of women and girls in Kern County. Thinking about these statistics and the theme of our symposium, we know that gender matters. It makes a difference in the lives of people. It affects educational attainment, income earnings, violence, and well-being. I hope that this these statistics have inspired you to think about the areas of need in our region and to begin to brainstorm about what you can do to make a difference for women and girls in Kern County. Thank you. Dr. Salisbury, you're muted. I'm just talking my apologies. Um, uh, thank you again, Dr. Jackson. Uh, the importance of the community to uh, Cal State Bakersfield is extremely uh, the heart and soul of, of what we do as educators. We are a town to gown institution. Um, we hope to continue uh, this connection with the community in a stronger way with our brand new ethnic studies department, which will hopefully be in operation in the fall. Um, but that is the key point. So thank you for bringing in those Kern County statistics. Uh, we are going to move on next to a special, special mentee of mine, uh, Miss Samantha Dela Cruz, who is a former Club Gin president. Um, she is the current Wendy Wayne Ethics Award winner. Um, she is also a graduate student at San Francisco State, and she is going to talk about Jay's library, who uh, Jay is very near and dear uh, to this program and to the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program. Welcome, Samantha. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Jackson, um, for providing all that information. I think it brings into context the conditions where resources like Jay's Library emerge from, um, where there's a lot of conditions in Kern County that need to be addressed. Um, and so today I'm here to talk about Jay's Library, which is something that um, very community driven project. Um, so Jay's Library, for those who don't know, is not only a safe space, but a physical resource of gender and sexuality affirming books that is located partially um, at CCB in um, Club Gen's room, which is in the Multicultural Alliance and Gender Equity Center. And it's also located um, in parts of it at Beale Library and parts of it at Ricky's Retreat, which is housed and ran by Bakersfield AIDS Project here in Kern County um, under the leadership of Audrey Chavez. So there, there's extensions of it all over Kern County, but what I'm gonna be talking about specifically is the part that is housed um, on CCB grounds. And so Jay's library formed um, at the, towards the beginning of 2017, um, as you know, the passing of Jay Bornstein um, happens in late 2016. And Jay Bornstein is a Jewish trans woman who was a Club Gen member and is, who's no longer with us. Um, and in the way that we traditionally know people to be with us. So um, it is something that the community friends, family of Jay came together and recognized that Jay did a lot of amazing work in this community. And to carry that legacy forward, we need to have something that's going to stay and continue on that mission. Because at the end of the day, trans, queer, women, girls, all these people need resources to contextualize their lives and to make sense of it and to move forward and to be empowered and to have the resources they need to navigate this world in a way that 
we have to make it safer and softer, as Jay would say, that we need a softer, safer place for people to exist where existing is not so hard to where we can just live and there are not threats to our lives and well-being in all the ways we navigate and are forced to navigate. So Jay's Library opened in 2018, um, November 16th at CUCB, and it's grown, um, I believe, in the fall of 2019 before the pandemic hit, we had like over 700 signatures of people who signed in and used the library or the space to some capacity. And so um, just within that first year where it's implemented, we saw a lot of growth and a lot of uh, usage of this place. And then since the pandemic, the library, you know, since it is a physical library, we are unsure what that will look like moving forward. But that's where I call on everyone in this call, beyond this call, and just in the community to make sure that that library is preserved and has what it needs to continue functioning and running and to grow. Because students need it, the community needs it, everyone needs it. Over my time at CCB, I spoke to hundreds and hundreds of students who, if they were not queer and trans themselves, they had queer and trans loved ones. They had things to they, they had questions and they needed answers. It wasn't a want, it was a need for their own survival and the survival and health and well-being of the community. So as we move forward, I hope that everyone continues to reflect on their proximity to Jay and Jay's library and their proximity to the issues that the library hopes to solve and create a resource for and to do their part, whether that's checking in as we move back to the reality of maybe having a, um, an in-person um, uh, start in the fall or whenever we come back um, to an in-person state of education to, is that library still there? Can I go visit it? Is there help that needs to be done? I'm sure those books are really dusty and there's a lot that can be done. Um, or maybe it's adding it to your syllabus. Even if you don't have a gender sexuality oriented class, it can be on your syllabus. You can advertise it and promote it to everyone who needs it because it's one thing to get a resource like this. It's another thing to keep it and have it healthy, thriving, and continuing. So that's on all of us. And that's what I would like to share today about Chase Library. So thank you for um, providing the space where I can talk about such an amazing resource that's community built, community run, and will continue to be a community space for years and years and years to come, I hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samantha. Uh, I want folks to remember this name, Samantha De La Cruz, because it's going to be a future doctor, Samantha De La Cruz, future faculty, okay? Um, moving from one future faculty to another, um, uh, De Solis um, is another great mentee of mine, alumnus, sociology department. Um, she is currently a graduate student at George Mason University in their sociology program. And she is gonna speak a few words about transgender issues. Welcome Dee. Hi, thanks Dr. Salisbury. Um, so my name is Delilah, I also go by Dee. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. And I am a very, very proud, openly trans masculine person and CUCB alumna, I think is how you say it. I don't know, I'm an alum. Um, before we start, I just wanted to um, invite everyone to just take a moment. Um, the information presented by Dr. Jackson and um, by Sam is something that isn't light. It's something that is heavy and hard. So I just wanna invite everyone to take a deep breath in and take a deep breath out. <sighs> because I know that times are very tough for a lot of us and many of us don't even have just the moment or the time to just breathe. Um, I thought long and hard about how I would approach this you know, conversation. And ultimately I decided that it's hard, right? It's hard to fit the topic into a five minute time slot. Um, on the one hand, there are a lot of urgent issues that are uh, impacting the trans and queer community, um, whether that be the immense amount of violence, harassment that um, they and we face, uh, lack of resources in terms of food security, housing security, uh, gender affirming care, mental health resources. But at the same time, I think I want to move beyond the conversation of tragedy and despair and move into some more of the 
positive things of our community. We are a brilliant, thriving, resilient community that has fought for hundreds of years against patriarchy, colonialism, racism, and injustice. And these are things that we're continuing to grow from and evolve. The community doesn't always get it right. And uh, we don't always get it right, but there's always room to expand. I think the topic that Dr. Jackson brought in about poverty in Kern County really is the foundation of what's going on here in the trans community in Kern County. We see, I'm going back into the tragedy thing. It's hard not to, right? We focus on tragedy. We focus on hardship, but I really want to invite everyone to think about what they can do in terms of supporting the trans community, supporting trans women, supporting trans black women, whether that be celebrating us. Um, you know, in my experience at CUCB, it really was the community kind of celebrating themselves and creating space for themselves. Um, and that doesn't mean that CSUB doesn't support the trans community. I think it just means that we have room to grow. We have room to really create events, create moments where we're not just waiting for a tragedy to happen to talk about trans people. Um, I know for one, I really cannot sit by and wait for another trans or queer person to be hurt or to lose their lives in order for action to happen. There's beautiful moments happening every day on our campus that should be celebrated. Um, at the same time, you know, as Samantha was talking about moving back to um, in person, um, you know, we might be able to have most of the campus community vaccinated by some period of time, right? That's kind of a eventual accomplishment that we can reach. But the lasting effects of the pandemic will not just disappear. Um, there's room for us as a community to step up and provide more resources for our students, um, to provide more safe spaces for our students, um, and to just really be the example in Kern County. I think CSUB is kind of the, the pride of Kern County in many ways. We have opportunity to do projects, to do service learning projects, to give community hours, um, and to just educate ourselves and other people in the community. Kern County doesn't have to be a hard place to live. It doesn't have to be unsurvivable. It doesn't have to be a place where queer people might be born here and then we leave to another city to live our lives. I think Kern County is a beautiful place for trans people to live. I just think that there's a lot that we can all do together. And I think the last thing I will say is that um, being trans doesn't exist in a vacuum. Trans issues are not just a singular issue. Um, there are trans people who are undocumented, who do not have housing, who do not have resources. There's trans people who are student researchers, who are professors on campus, who um, just do every part of your life, there is a trans or queer person there. So I just wanna ask that we stop making trans issues and trans people a footnote and instead center trans people and celebrate trans people at any opportunity that we can. Thank you. Thank you, Dee, for those powerful words. That's, that's facts. Um, moving from that concept of what Dee said about not making trans uh, individuals a footnote, um, I am very proud to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, uh, the director of the Dreamers Resource Center, which is for our undocumented students who are extremely important part of our community, um, Ms. Hilda of Venezuela. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me just share my screen real quickly. I would like to take a moment to, to thank um, Dr. Salisbury for allowing me the opportunity to be here today um, and present to you all. Can you all see that? Yes. Oh, thank you. 
All right. So my name is Hilda Nieblas and um, I oversee the CSUB Dreamers Resource Center. Uh, Dee did an excellent job at uh, helping to transition to this uh, presentation today. And I will make it uh, pretty quick, give you some information about the center. And at the end of the presentation, I will give you my contact info for you all to reach out to, to us and determine ways we can better support you. So let's get into it. So the Dreamers Resource Center at CSUB is dedicated to providing support and resources to our students who identify as being undocumented AB 540 recipients, DACA recipients, or students from mixed status families. I do want to shed some light um, or focus on the mixed status family component. Uh, we do provide services and support for those who uh, have maybe uh U.S. status. However, they are part of a family where everyone in their immediate family has a different status. We recognize, um, especially at TSUB, that a, a parent guardian or siblings uh, undocumented status can impact the student experience at CSUB. And so we want to make sure that we also provide services and support for this group of students. So the most popular service that we provide is the free legal immigration services, which we host every two weeks. Um, currently in this virtual space, those consultations are over the phone. We work with a group of eight amazing attorneys that provide you with the guidance you may need to go through any immigration process. And I also want to talk a little bit more about this because there are different resources that are available um, and different visas that individuals don't always um know about that can be applied for, but the only way to find out if you can apply for them is through seeing an immigration attorney. Uh, again, the service is free of charge for you as a student, but you as a mixed status family stu student, you can use these services to support your family members. So even if you have, if you were born in the United States or you hold residency or citizenship, you can use these benefits for your family members, immediate family members. And then we support you through the application process, whether that's um, the DREAM Act application, financial aid, as well as other scholarship opportunities, both um, on and off campus. So we use a lot of resources um, that we share with students off campus for scholarships. Uh, there's several different organizations you can reach out to and that don't take into consideration um, immigration status. And then the uh, residency application support, there is a component at the university where individuals who have uh, the qualifications uh, get sort of a scholarship towards um, in-state tuition. And then Know Your Rights presentations and workshops. This is a huge one for us, especially um, knowing your rights in case um, you are in a situation with law enforcement, um, ICE, or even knowing your rights as um in terms of immigration services. So this is actually a collaborative work with our immigration attorneys. So they talk about all of the different um, services they provide and all of the different visas and permits you can apply for um, if you qualify. And then we help connect students to other resources on and off campus. So like I said earlier, the mixed status family component goes for both um, Sides, whether you're you're you the student is undocumented or not. And so we do try to work with external organizations for other services, as well as we have a plethora of services in terms of basic basic needs that um, on campus that can help both the student and their family members. And then we do have a physical space in Rohan Hall which um, we hope all of you will be have the opportunity to come and visit us. Um, once we're back on campus. And then we do share a space with the Magic Center, which is also another center that we work very closely with in terms of services and support. And then the biggest one is the advocacy piece. So bringing the voice of our students to the table, whether it's at a committee 
or um, a community organization, as well as if a student may not feel um, comfortable exposing their legal identity to another department and they have a question specific to a department, we can then um, represent you as a student on campus. And then and this is my contact info. We are virtual. So this is my email as well as our office phone. And it is connected to our um, cell phone. So as long as we're not in a meeting or um, on the phone with another student, we typically answer the phone. But you can reach out to us and we look forward to meeting you all. Thank you for being here. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to present to you all. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Hilda. Um, if you have any questions or comments uh, for our current opening speakers, um, you know, please feel free uh, to go ahead and raise your hand or make a ask a question in the Q&A. Um, we're going to do a couple of little housekeeping uh, before we get to our first opening speaker of the day, Miss Tiffany Cross. Um, if you have registered, you're going to receive a link to uh, Panera Bread. Uh, you have 48 hours to use your link starting tomorrow um, to get lunch. So we, we're providing lunch and a show here. Um, secondly, um, with our speakers, if you have any questions for our main speakers, please make sure you start putting your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we will have an option to give you a chance to ask your question live if you wish. Um, if you're shy, you can just put your question in and I will uh, ask it, uh, but I will say your name. Um, uh, I just wanna acknowledge a few people that have really helped with this event. Uh, Ms. Emily Callahan, uh, who is the Director of Campus Programming, uh, Afaf, who is the coordinator for campus programming, uh, Christian Rodriguez, who made our wonderful flyers and our uh, Zoom backgrounds that you see here, and Brendan Chase, who's also from campus programming, who is helping us out with this event today. This could have never come together without their assistance. Uh, we've had great fun. Uh, we've got great sponsors on this event. We have the Kegley Institute of Ethics, which will be hosting uh, Dr. Imbram Kendi on April 14th, so don't miss that. The Black Faculty and Staff Association and our wonderful student group that is connected directly to uh, Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Club GIN. Um, so we've had a great community connection here. We also are on IRA funding from the uh, uh, Your Student Government, which we greatly appreciate to bring programs such as this to you. Um, so this is a truly CSUB family event. Uh, we do hope to be back in person. Uh, we do get to have a lot of fun. It's 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 uh, hard not to have an audience and not to hear the laughter and the clapping and uh, to get the spontaneous reactions. So we hope to be back together very soon. Okay. Any any questions or comments? I'll give it a minute. Okay. Well. Um, please don't forget that you can do that. I want to speak to what's important about today. What's important about today and why I say we have the theme, women in America, um, what we should do next, is not ignoring men. Men are important in this discussion, particularly when we are talking about women. We need men to be allies. We need men to be at the forefront to call out other men or to call in other men to support women. Um, uh, what works for women works for men. Um, if, if you are supportive of us, we can be supportive of you. Um, but we are at a crossroads for women in American society. Uh, we have the Me Too movement uh, that has been effective of bringing light to uh, sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, but the problem seems to be continuing if you follow the news. We've got to find a way to address this. Um, we're looking at violence increasing against uh, transgender women. Uh, we had an incident here in Bakersfield uh, against a transgender man. Um, this is violence that can't do. We've had a national mass shooting in Atlanta. 
And also recently in Colorado, once again, women were the main target of this violence. Uh, we're sending a message to women in America that we are not safe. And that just simply can't stand. Um, additionally, this pandemic has exposed that women are in a serious economic crisis. We had a period where uh, one month, all the jobs that were lost, over 145,000 lives were all lost by women. Um, we don't know the beginnings of the damage that has been done to women's economic status and their educational status, interrupting education. And so this has been a major setback. So what we are doing to do today is, is try to be, as Dee said, um, positive. What do we do next? We know what the problems are and we're trying to deal with what can we do as a group and work together to do that. Um, the, the main focus today uh, beyond women is principally women of color and young women of color. We have an amazing panel of young women from CSUB who are very active in the community and on campus and are from a diverse number of, of majors that are going to make a serious impact in future. And it's very important to hear what young women have to say uh, because they're going to be contributing to the future. Us old heads like me, uh, you know, we get to yell and, and stamp and do what we need to do now in this moment, but the future is there. So I'm very excited about seeing that. So today is a day of reflection. We want to have a conversation. We want to hear what you have to say. Uh, we want you to interact at the best as best as we can in this virtual atmosphere. So please feel free to do that. Don't be a passive listener. Be an engaged listener to my students that are out there. We are also going to be giving away books. Um, so uh, we'll have copies of Tiffany Cross's book and we'll have copies of Dr. Sophia Noble's book and other copies of books as we have traditionally done at this event. We want to educate people and usually giving you something to have in your hand is a very nice thing. Um, so please look forward to that. Um, we are expecting our first guest in a few minutes. Um, but I'm going to give you a chance right now to take a little coffee break or bathroom break. I would say come back at, uh, you know, don't disappear. You don't have to close your window, but come back at 945 and we will restart again in terms of programming. Um, unless there is someone that wishes to make comments uh, or ask questions or if we can have a little impromptu discussion. Actually, I'd like to do that. I always am in teacher mode right now. Can I get my. Uh, young people and Hilda to come back on. Uh, Dr. Dugan, I see you here if you're ready to join us. And uh, let's have a little conversation while we're waiting. I'd like to do that. Let's use our time as valuably as we can. All right, there's Dr. Dugan. For po people that don't know, this is my, my, my very close friend and buddy. Uh, Dr. Rhonda Dugan from the Sociology Department, Associate Professor of Sociology, who is awesome. Um, Crystal, if you're there, we'd love to have you in this conversation, and Brianna. Um, all right. Folks, welcome. Good morning. We are in a new age. This is CSUB's 50th anniversary. I would like to say to you, what would you like to see CSUB do for the community and particularly for our the female community of CSUB in the next 50 years? Jump in if you're you're on mute, you unmute yourself. Okay, I'll go first. Um I think uh one thing I want to see is just more active participation um, and maybe like, you know, there's a recent survey that was done in 2018 with current high school district ninth graders in terms of what type of resources and knowledge they know about LGBTQ topics. Um, I'm looking here and it said that over 83% did not know where to go if they wanted information or support. Um, in terms of gender identity, sexual orientation, or LGBTQ issues, and 90% of the ninth graders did not learn about LGBTQ plus issues or people in class. So as these students are graduating from their high schools and coming into CSUB, they're already at a disadvantage in terms of their knowledges, their access to resources. 
So I think in terms of what CSUB can do is we need to stop going for the minimum and go beyond if we really want to make things equitable and reduce the gaps that are being created. Because, you know, although there are positive changes coming from the K through 12 system here in Kern County, there's still a lot of work to do. So I think that's where we can come in as educators, as community members to really just close that gap a little bit more. Feel free to jump in. I, I just wanted to add to that and just say that we're all capable of doing so much. Like we are like Dalal and I as students and other students here, we have always like, put ourselves in places where we wanted to be a part of change and to bring about that change to go about it. And I think that we all need to trust ourselves and each other that we are capable of bringing about the changes we do want to see. So having conversations about like, like right now, what that looks like. So having the resources and materials in place to that aren't just like supplemental, but like they're a necessity. Like students need this to thrive. They can't contribute in class conversations if they're hungry or facing violent transphobia every day or undocumented and don't have the resources or the financial means of being here and being in that seat. Like it's more than just showing up sometimes. It's all the stuff that leads up to how we can show up. So I think that all of us in all our different positions of power and all the spaces that we are in, we can do a lot. And it's going to look a lot of different ways, but it's up to us. And it's also us to asking for help when we don't really know where, what to do or what that looks like. So if there's anyone um, here today who has questions, like ask us. A lot of us, ha ha um, we had to figure it out as we went along. But you don't have to um, struggle um, and by yourself. You can rely on us as a community to help you and to support you and to build with you a world that we want to all live in and feel safe and happy to live in. Awesome. I'll jump in as well. Um, well something that I look forward to in the next 50 years for CSUB um, is definitely, so let me, let me give some context. Um, when I was in high school, um, I was inspired to go to college because of um, an Asian immigrant woman who told me to go to college. And so on that same note, I really hope that CSUB and other higher education, especially the CSU, um, commits itself to more diverse hires and their faculty because it really makes a difference. If you identify with your professor, your teacher in, in um, high school, then you're more likely to stay in um, the degree that you're in or continue pursuing your higher education dreams. Um, and that's because um, you identify with this woman um, for me, a woman of color, um, Dr. Kip Glazer. She is now a um, president over, I believe, in the San Bernardino area. And um, they they know the struggles that you go through and you can identify with the struggles and they can tell you, hey, I made it through it. This is how you make it through it. And so um, the next 50 years, I really hope that I see more professors that look like me and look like the community. Dr. Dugan, you want to jump in on that? Well, I'm an old head, too, so I was letting the younger folks talk so they can have some space. But I, I think I think all the points I, I completely agree with. And, and like Crystal, um, you know, I had that experience, even though it wasn't a Black woman, it was a Puerto Rican woman. I have had two Puerto Rican women as mentors, um, and it was it was like, you're going to grad school. It was kind of a question, but also kind of telling like, you got to do this. So um, I basically wouldn't be here where I am without them. And so I think what I want to add is that, you know, thinking, oh, wow, the next 50 years, that sounds really grand, right? And, and overwhelming. And I think when we talk about issues of social change, I always want to share with my students that change doesn't have to be magnanimous, right? We sort of want to see this overhaul happen and quickly. And I, I like to share with students and say, sometimes those little small changes have, you know, as much impact as some, you know, law instituted, right? And so I think because it can be discouraging when laws don't happen, but there are little things in our communities, um, with our folks, our people, our campus that you can do and still feel like you're part of the process because I know it can be discouraging when things don't happen quickly. So I think that 
and, and I'm going to keep saying this, doctor, you know, we're all the old heads on the call, um, <laughs> Gen Xers, I can say, you know, it, I understand that feeling. And it took a while for me to learn that, you know, change is slow, but you keep working at it and you take a little piece at a time. So that would be advice, um, perspective in thinking about the next 50 years. And, and, and I'd like um, Hilda to jump on in, jump in this, but I, I, I would like to say this one thing I would love to see from CSUB students. I want you to own this place. You've earned your place. You belong here. And so that's always been my thing is that, you know, we say a lot of things about first time college students. We say a lot of things about rural students. We say a lot of things about undocumented students. We say a lot of things about LGBTQ students. We say a lot of things about students of color that are very meant to be positive, but they are very discouraging. And instead we need to say, this is your place. This is your institution. You will be an alumni. You are a runner and this is your space. So I, my next steps while I'm here, the remaining time I'm here as the old head, I will be getting after every single one of you as students to be positive that you belong here and that you can eat this school up. You can get through every adversity because you got through a lot of adversity to get here and people need to stop reminding you of it and let you celebrate what you're doing right now. And that's what I'd like to see. And particularly because I, I, I am deeply proud of our undocumented students. And we say that as if there's something wrong with that. And there is nothing wrong with that. Our undocumented students work just as hard as everyone else um, and exceed that, truthfully. And so we need to own that and, and stop making people that we have othered invisible. No more invisible. I want everybody to throw their invisibility cloaks away and I want them to step up and say, I'm here, I'm gonna be here and I'm not going anywhere. I am deeply proud of the panelists, the student panelists we're gonna have here. I'm extremely biased uh, about uh, caring about them as you can obviously see uh, because we are, we have some of the best students and we need to stop apologizing for that. CSUB, we have a brilliant future ahead of us if we reach out and grab it. And I would just like to echo everything everyone on here has said, but I think also it's important to remember our own identities make us resilient, right? And it's your superpower. Use that to help the community. I think right now, as we continue to make high school presentations, I realize we all have uh, that small responsibility to go in. I don't necessarily believe that the education begins when the student gets to CSUB, right? We, re we need to reach out to the high school level and mentor the youngins, <laughs> however we want to put it, and, you know, pull them in. Because as first generation, sometimes even the idea of college isn't there till sometimes it's too late, right? And so how can we individually take the responsibility to go into these spaces and to um, even if we're not asked, right, that we're bringing in that information and that education to the high school and even the uh, middle school level to have um, individuals start that that thought process. OK, I know someone who went to college, even though they're not they may not be related to me, but I feel comfortable with this person that I can reach out and then. um just celebrating each other. I think that's the biggest one, supporting each other through all of the educational and personal successes that everyone has. I think um, that's a big one that I hope um, to help with, you know, celebrating each other and making sure that we're all doing baby things and baby steps towards um, a better CSUB, but also a better community and a better world in general. All right, awesome. As I've learned with doing Zoom, you've always got those students who sit there and look at you even though you say log on. So I'm going to do what I do. Brittany or Uchechi or Brianna, do you have anything to say or are you uh, doing double duty, which you students seem to be doing all the time, got something else going? If not, I'm going to throw it back to some of our other panelists if they want to add or say anything else. 
Good morning, everyone. I I am doing double duty because women are rock stars and we are women. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say um, I really am honored to be here. And I love the conversation about equity because in the earlier presentation, when we were just talking about women in Kern, I realized, even though I'm not originally from Kern, I am a Kern woman because I am attending CSUV, Woot Woot Class 2021. Um, and I think it's very important that we look at what's in our backyard before we think globally, because as you can see, we are all going out to do different things. Like some of the women here are already grads from other places, but they want to come back to CSUB because we care about Bakersfield and the Kern County because that's our community. And when we care about our community, we can make those changes. And I feel like that's what's so needed is first that concern to have the empathy to go ahead and make those changes. Very cool. All right, we have a question from, uh, oh, Bree, uh, you wanna say something? Yeah, um, hi everyone, my name is Brianna. I usually go by Bree, so you can say Bree. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and Aya, and I'm very happy and excited to see a lot of people here today that I haven't seen because of the pandemic. So like, hello everyone, I hope everyone's been holding up as best as they can be. Um, well, uh, I'm someone who comes from McFarland, and I guess when we talk about Kern, I hear talk about, you know, um, Taft, Lamont, Bakersfield, but not never necessarily about Delano or McFarland. And like, I'm not someone who, when I grew up, I had someone who had gone to college. So I had that example to look to. Um, I came from a very small, like, like, I guess you could say um, small minded community, um, very traditional Latinx household. And I just had a lot of like the structural, like systemic things that were bringing me down and not necessarily showing me that like higher education is something that I should be aiming for. Because to be honest, not until my, mm, I want to say my junior year in high school is when I started to take my academics seriously. Because before I I didn't, I just didn't have the type of like, not like the comprehensive um, knowledge about college and higher education like I do now. Um, and I want to say like, I guess what really did help me um, start coming into higher education and supported me as like a student who needed that support very much um, was just like meeting other people outside of my um, community instead of just sticking to McFarland. Um, I went out and started meeting other people who had the same issues as I did, but um, were able to also guide me into like a space where I can think of myself as, yes, I am college ready. Yes, I can be academic. Yes, I'm smart. Um, and I know a lot of the things that y'all touched on are ways that did help me significantly as a student. Um, and so I'm just really happy and glad to be here at CCB. I'm almost done. I'm a senior. So woo, I'm a fifth year too. So yay to fifth year seniors. Nothing wrong. All wine gets poured and it is right time. We have one question just for the panelists because this has gone very well. Is uh, from a wonderful and amazing long-term CSUB staffer, Martha Ruiz. She wants to know what can we do to support or contribute to the different causes that you guys have laid out? I think uh, one way that, you know, anybody from any position in their life or their worldview, because a lot of us come with different resources in our back pocket, with different just levels of what we can give from ourselves and from what we have. So I think just to start is looking at where are you and what is it that you have to contribute? What are your skills? Because we all have a skill. We all have something to add to the community. There's not one way to contribute. There's not one path. Some of us can cook really good. And so you just need to make a good meal for somebody because I know there was times when I didn't have a meal to go home to or just a home cooked meal in general. Some of us are good at playing music. Play some inspiring music for people. Some of us are good listeners reach out to some friends and ask them what they're going through. Some of us are writers. Some of us can make videos. Some of us are educators. You know, there's so many ways to contribute. I think it just starts with looking what you have to offer and looking at where you have to grow in terms of your own knowledge 
and then deciding what are ways that I want to be a part of this? Because I think like trying to create like a here's how you help isn't really realistic, especially right now during a pandemic. Some of us can't even leave our homes at all, even for groceries. So I think it really starts with looking at where you're at and just looking at what's your goal. What do you like? Do you want to create community? Do you want to help create resources? Do you just want to get in touch with people? I think it starts there. I'd love to add um, with when you're talking about how can you support us, I suppose in an indirect, indirect way, um, you know, at CSUB, uh, many of us are um, privileged and lucky enough to sit on things like committees and places where policy actually happens and change happens and the future of CSUB happens, right? And so when you're going into those spaces, um, and it's been a it's been a new philosophy of mine to to look at who's invited to the table look at the participant list before it's even like the first meeting is even convened, look at, look at the participant list and think of who's at this table right now and who isn't. And should we, in, should we extend the invitation to somebody that is not at the table? And the reason why that's so important is because not only do we forget about the people who aren't at the table, but the people that are, you know, the best to advocate for the ones that are not at the table, the people who are not at the table. Um, they understand the struggles and they understand the solutions that they need in order to achieve their degree. So when we're talking about CHP in specific, how do we get students to achieve their degree better? And, you know, sometimes we need a student. Sometimes we need a student of color. Sometimes we need a student who's a woman. Um, and we need to include those voices. It's really important that we take a moment to examine our privilege and examine who is at the room. All right, guys, we will be moving right ahead. If you want to take a quick break to uh, run to the restroom or get a drink of water, please do so. We're going to be getting ready for our student panel, uh, which is going to be uh, moderated and led by uh, Afaf Adelaide, um, director, co coordinator of campus program. And I was giving you a promotion, Afaf. Um, don't, don't tell Emily. Um, so can I get my uh, uh, student panelists to log on? And actually, if they have time and they don't mind, um, if you 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 youngsters don't mind the old heads joining you, Samantha De La Cruz and uh, D, if they have time and they join in, they will let you do the speaking, and I'm gonna let Afaf take it over. Um, I don't know about y'all, Tiffany Krause was awesome, but here we will go. All right. Thank you, Dr. Salisbury. She was awesome. I'm a little nervous to follow that amazing conversation, but um, I'm also really excited because I have such a great team of student leaders here with me. Um, hello, everyone. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Salisbury, for inviting me to be a part of this great event um, and this wonderful panel. Um, my name is Afaf Aldalai. Um, I am the campus programming coordinator. I'm also a Muslim Yemeni American woman, um, and I've lived in Bakersfield for most of my life. I'm a double alumna um, here at CSUB. I got my degree, my undergrad in business marketing, and I just recently got my MBA. So CSUB is like my, my second home. Um, and um, I've had the honor of meeting some of these amazing people in our, in my, in our panel and so many other people um, on campus that have inspired me in so many ways. Um, and I have the honor to share this virtual stage with um, so many of these young, Amer uh, young women so let's just get right into this and let me introduce um, my panel. Um, I'm kind of reading it off and I think you all are, are in order of my little bios here. So um, our first panelist is Zeltsin Esther Rodriguez. Um, she is a senior who is double majoring in English and psychology. Um, she's a social justice and ethnic studies news reporter for the school's independently, independently run newspaper, The Runner. Um, she also works at the writing um, as a writing tutor for the CSUB Writing Resource Center, and she has a passion for learning and understanding human experience. Um, our next panelist is Uchechi Okidiki. She is um, a junior uh, majoring in biology. Uh, she is a CSUB student for quality education intern and deeply committed to making the college experience better for all students. Um, she is also a student assistant for the Helen Hawks Honor Program and the president for the junior year experience program. 
We also have Brittany Johnson, who is a senior majoring in psychology with a uh, in philosophy with a minor in psychology. Um, she is also an intern at the Kegley Institute of Ethics, a CSUB athletics assistant academic advisor, the treasurer of the CSUB philosophy club, and the secretary of Phi Sigma Tau National Philosophy Honor S Society CSUB chapter. She plans to continue her academic studies pursuing a MS degree in educational counseling here at CSUB. Crystal Rains, who we um, have been introduced to just now, but she is the very first um, CSU trustee from Bakersfield, first student. She is the 2020 to 2022 trustee. Um, on campus, she works as a campus as a computer science supplemental instructor as she pursues her undergrad degree in computer science. As a first generation student, Asian American Pacific Islander woman, she had to fight um, for her degree in collaboration with other amazing women on campus. And last but not least, Brianna Santaella. Uh, yeah, Santaella. I've been <laughs> trying, I'm going to get that right. Um, she is a junior majoring in women's gender and sexuality studies. She's a longtime member of Club Gen and the current president um, of the organization. And she is a committed activist to LGBTQ plus issues and race and social issues. Um, these are short bios. I know these women personally, and I know how all of the amazing things they do in these bios do not do them justice. So thank you all for being here. Um, and so let's just get right into the questions here. Um, and the way this is going to work, um, just feel free to jump in. Um, and I kind of want to go in order and it, it's a conversation. So um, if you have something to chime in, feel free to. And of course, our chat is open for um, if you have any questions for any of the panelists. So feel free to ask in that Q&A. Um, so for the first question is, what do you think about the status of women in America, particularly young women of color? Um, what things are you optimistic about? What things are you pessimistic about? I can jump right in with the optimism. Um, I'm certainly optimistic because we have a Black vice president of the United States of America, and she's a Black woman. Um, vice President Harris is such an inspiration, so I feel like that's optimistic um, just because representation matters so much, and that's why I love that our panel is also so diverse and the speakers are so diverse because representation is key in getting women to want to do those things. So now there's little girls who see that there's a vice president who's black and she's a female. And they're like, oh my gosh, I can be a vice president because I'm black or because I'm Asian American, because I'm female, like I can do those things. Because before a lot of things that we see with women, especially with the equity, the inequity that is in pay that we were watching our first presentation, there's a lack of asking for women because they don't know that they can ask those kind of questions. And so I'm optimistic to see with all of these women doing great things now in different fields, like the increase of women in STEM or the increase of women in politics, that's going to make more women decide that, hey, I can see myself in this role versus just as a caretaker or just as blank or whatever ceiling they've been put upon in their community. I'd love to add to that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Um, I'd love to add to that. Um, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris um, has honestly been an inspiration to all of us and um, showing us that, you know, um, to echo, showing us that um, it is possible as a woman of color to achieve these high, high um, uh, ranks. When I saw this picture of her versus is all the former vice presidents and how different and how um, groundbreaking she is. And so um, with that, um, also education is really positive for women. Um, college enrollment rates since 2000 have been increasing for women and actually have been higher than men. Um, but some some harder some of the harder things that I'm a bit pessimistic about to bring that in to address your question um, is about how hard we are hit when it comes to jobs. Um, when we're, with regards to COVID. Um, one million more jobs have been lost by women, um, primarily because of things in the home, right? And so anecdotally, I know that um, there are some older women that I've talked to that said that they had to give up their job attainment, their, deg their, their degrees, their, their hopes and dreams because um, they were expected to stay at home for the kids. 
Um, and there's also this social stigma and pressure for women to, um, there is this joke that um, Ali Wong makes in her um, standups where she, um, if you, you don't know, she she did stand up while she was pregnant and then she's still currently doing stand up after birth. And people commonly ask her, who's taking care of the baby? And so while she like gives it as a joke, that is a very real question that a lot of women in business have to face. When this answer is very simple, you hire a babysitter or you split the, the job 50-50. Um, and so there's this pressure and there's this negative stigma that women constantly have to fight every day, whether consciously or unconsciously when it comes to the workplace. Thank you, Crystal. That is so true. No, no one asks our, our you know, male counterparts, who's taking care of your child? That's that's not a go to question. Um, but, you know, if anyone else wants to chime in, like, what do you think of the, the current status? Has that changed throughout your life? Um, the current status of a woman in America? Hi, I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, so for me, I think the current status has definitely improved over the years. Um, where we are now is drastically different than where we were just even a couple of years ago or even to say a couple months ago. Um, I do think that um, representation matters, of course, and everything, but um, when it comes down to like the heart and soul of it, I do think that community and um, building community and having that community um, be strong at like, it's what's important and it's ultimately what's gonna liberate all people. Um, we have to think about people who are being affected, although there is a black woman president, um, a liberal like, rule right now. We have to think about the women who are being um, affected, who are incarcerated. Um, we have to think about the people who are being re misrepresented. Um, Black trans women are still like greatly affected. They're one of the most vulnerable um, groups in like uh, in the world, essentially. And um, I do think that although we see so much diversity in the workplace, um, there is sort of also um, like a capitalized idea of like what like of this diversity in a workplace, like it looks good on paper, but is it actually making structural change? Is it actually helping women of color, black women, indigenous women? Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I'd love to add on to that, Brianna, um, to address like the status of women. I think that although we've come a long way, there's still a lot of social stigmas that exist in uh, in society for women that are kind of holding us back, although we are granted a lot of newer opportunities. Um, women are still hypersexualized. Women are still seen as weaker than. And I think to bring in um, some pessimism, I'm pessimistic about the K through 12 education standards and how I feel like there's not enough representation of women in history books and of some of our achievements that would allow for people to have a different um, idea of what women are capable of and what women have provided to society besides just maybe beauty standards or things that we typically, or as a society, people typically associate women with. So I would love to see a, a structural change like that, that could help bring the society further and grant more opportunities and a, a, a truer narrative to, to the female history, to women history. Uh, but to, to bring in some optimism, I would say that technology is bringing us, is taking us to that place where I, I can see a lot of my women friends and even my male friends sharing women history through their social media, bringing more awareness to um, the accomplishments that we've made um, and all of the things that we're capable of. So I can see that going a long way, but I really do think that until there is a, a systemic change in the K through 12 education system, that it's going to be, it's going to be a long route. Um, I think just to kind of add to that, I am very optimistic about the future of women in society, because I think with our current generation, there it's there's been a lot of barriers broken and people w women and even young, the young generation using their voices for change and not being afraid to ask the tough questions and put yourself in a room where you don't see people like you so when it comes to the optimism optimism part of it um i'm very optimistic about it because i think um the changes that we're seeing today will continue because there is this um mindset of I'm not going to take 
just what someone offers to me. I'm going to fight for what I need. I'm going to go out there and look for what I want to, what I want to, what change I want to see in the world and what change I want to see that would affect me and those around me. And I'm also a really big advocate for um, seeing people who look like you. Because sometimes when you are kind of going through life on your own, like going through life and trying to hustle and do what you need to do, especially as women, um, like like most of my family said, like there's the question of like, who's going to take care of your kids? Or if as women at a certain age, you ask the question, are you going to get married? Um, when are you going to have a kid? When are you going to settle down? So those kind of questions are Right. Like, granted, that's what some of us do want in the future, but it's not really a question that's asked to our counterpart, counterparts. Right. So I'm very, very optimistic. And, and going back to, to seeing people who look like you, seeing women in high paying jobs, high paying positions, making decisions, also having a life and set an example of you can have it all. Like you can, you can do the work, you can do the school and you can have a family life and still be good and and not be seen as less than or um, weaker than the other sex. I'm really optimistic about the future because I, from what I've seen in our generation, in our current generation and the future generation is we are not afraid to ask the tough questions. We're not afraid to question, like ask the question, why? Like, why is this done? Why? How can it be changed? How can how can we do this? There's some optimistic about that aspect of it, too. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a list of questions, but I'm going to move around kind of based on on your answers. But what has helped you persevere in, in spaces or situations if you have felt unwelcomed or you felt um, like any of these? you know, topics that you spoke about have held you back in some way um, or, you know, self-doubt, imposter syndrome, whatever it may be. What's something that's helped each of you persevere? Um, I can hop into that answer um, because there are certain people in my mind. I know the previous speaker, as well as many speakers before us, have talked a lot about sisterhood and talked a lot about um, that support system of women and mentorship. And so I would love to, to shout out a few people. So Alaria Pesco, I don't know if she's here. Um, if you're in the CHB community, um, you've definitely heard of her. She's an absolutely amazing woman. Um, people like Dr. Zalesny, um, the president of the university, she's amazing. Um, as well as Jen at the Counseling Center. Um, people at CSUB are here to help you. Um, growing up, I had very little support at home and actually I had to like run away from home because of an abusive situation. And it was only because of women in my life that told me this is how you get out um, and this is how you can get support and this is how you can get resources have really empowered me to get to where I am now. Um, and so it, you have to rely on other people, other people that look like you, other people that understand your struggles, because um, you are your best advocate, but sometimes you don't know how to advocate for yourself. So um, you have to get that advice from other people. Um, I'll jump in. So for me, I do identify as a queer and or pansexual um, woman. So um, growing up, I necessarily didn't have the space to kind of explore that and to learn that about myself. And um, something that really did help persevere and like help me come to just um, find myself really is to build community. Um, and I started doing that um, once I got to CCB and like to name some few folks, Samantha, Delilah, Salis Dr. Salisbury, um, they all have created space for me to be able to explore what it is to be queer and a woman and Latinx, um, what did it means to come from a low income, um, undocumented family. Um, so all of these things um, are ways that have like helped me and also helped like find myself. Um, and they're also like things that are important to um, center when it comes to talking about um, women. We have to like think about yeah, we can create spaces for women, but are they being all inclusive? Are they including trans women? Are they including non-binary people? Um, are they including including trans or um, queer people just in general? Um, so, yeah. Thank you. What helped me too, um, as Uchechi, Uchechi, am I saying your name right? I 
Yeah, Uchechi and Brittany were saying earlier about representation. That definitely helped me out a lot. When I first came to CSUB, I had a teacher, Dr. Monica Ayuso, who she's been really um, helpful in helping me find my power as a woman, as a Latina woman in particular. The way that she lectures is so eloquent and so knowledgeable. And seeing her do it made me think, okay, like if she's a Latina woman that can do it, then I can do it as well. And she teaches ethnic literatures. And at that um, um, formal education of um, a people's history, which I, I also went to humanities magnet, which taught um, history of all different types of disadvantaged groups in American society. And seeing that and the ways that people have persevered out of negative situations makes me feel okay. Like, although I do have these stigmas working against me, there's many people who look like me or who have dealt with situations similar to mine that have uh, come out better for it, come out stronger for it from it and done amazing things. So definitely seeing that has helped me overcome my imposter syndrome, but I will say that it's definitely a gradual thing and it's not really consistent. It's not like you learn one thing and it's like, Oh, flip the switch. And now I, I just, my imposter syndrome is completely gone. It, it's a gradual process, but definitely representation helps. I totally second results and um, about representation and imposter syndrome, because there is no quick switch. I wish that that would be a thing. Like all of a sudden I wake up and be like, yes, I am superwoman. I can do this because even though we are superwoman, we have to have a lot of people that are in our corner who reinforce our cake. And I, I say that because the women in my life that have mentored me, um, there's women that have inspired me and mentored me in a way that they may not even know. And I feel like that's just because knowing that there's someone doing what I hope to do is sometimes just the encouragement that you need to keep doing what you're doing. Um, as a student here at CSUB, some of the women that have touched my life are actually on this call. Um, I have uh, Dr. Rhonda Dugan is awesome. She's one of the most amazing people. And she's so cool. And I'm so excited to have known her. But also Dr. Cargill is also on here. And she's amazing. I had a really great conversation with her when I was actually thinking about going into law. And it was mostly because I was just, I had that, like <laughs> one of the presenters, Tiffany Cross, was talking about that anger that motivates you. I was actually um, in a symposium before, earlier last year that was talking about the executive order and how women on campus feel silenced for sexual assault and domestic abuse. And when we were just looking at the executive order that was passed by our previous president, it was very limiting for the victims and for women. And so I was so fired up about it that one of the people was like, have you thought about law school? I was like, no, I haven't, but maybe I should. And so I was like, let me go talk to someone who knows about law. And so I had a conversation. And even though I'm not going to law school in the immediate future or anything, it was just a great conversation to sit with someone who said, yes, your space should be reclaimed. And yes, you should take up that space. And I felt like those kind of conversations are not happening enough for women of color. And so that's why you see so many women who question themselves or doubt that they can take up space and whatever that space may be. Um, I work with a lot of scholar athletes. So what we usually work with is the opposite of that. We don't usually come into the gate with athletes with low confidence because we're a division one school. So they got here because they know that they're good at something. However, when it gets to the academic side, that's when you have those kind of struggles with that student where you have to reinforce them in that way. And I feel like that's important to do because you need to find where that area of weakness is for that person and you need to pour into that person. And I feel like that's what the mentorship at CSUB has had on lock because the people here really pour into you. And that's why people say CSUB feels like a family because it is. Um, when it comes to like my success as a, as a student here at CSUB, I want to say just my success as a student in general kind of started, I'll say in high school in a little bit because I moved to this country when I was like 10. So when it comes to like the imposter syndrome, I want to say I kind of lived it, breathed it. Like it was part of my life for like a good, <laughs> a good couple of years. Where I had to figure out um, my new uh, where where I fit in into like the classrooms. Where if I I became very conscious of the fact that like if I was in a classroom and I turned around, I was the only black person in the classroom because I was that person who took the AP classes, who took the honors classes because I'm Nigerian and you are <laughs> you were trained. <laughs> Brittany is also Nigerian, so she she she, she resonates. Um, you are trained. <laughs> You, you're, you're trained, not necessarily trained, but you're really empowered with 
the importance of education, I would say, because it's you are go get a good education because the, once you're educated, everything else kind of falls into place. And I'm honestly a big believer of that um, because you have the knowledge to figure out where to go, who to, who to turn to and all of that. So I would say my success kind of started in high school a little bit where I met, again, someone who looked like me the advisor for the BSU, Mrs. Brown. Um, she's from Stockdale. She's now at BSU, uh, BSU uh, excuse me, BHS. But at Stockdale, she, I had like one of the most honest conversation with that woman because she is, um, she kind of reminds me a little bit of Dr. Salisbury, a little bit, where she will tell you like, this is what, the, this is it. Like, this is what you need to know. This is what you need to do. Um, there's no slacking off. Just get what you need to do done. Right. So it started there and um, coming to CSUB, like being very active at in high school and then coming to CSUB, I made it a point to be as involved as possible to know my campus, to know my professors, to know my to know where I am. Right. Know my campus and know what I what this campus can offer me and what I can offer the campus back. So. One of the main programs that I do talk about every single time is really being part of the Sensational Sophomore Program because that kind of like created my start, I would say. I was mentored in that program by, by Mike, but specifically also by like Emily because she's become one of the greatest mentors that I've, I've had like as I continue um, my college journey. Because I literally reach out to her, I'm like, I'm, I'm stressed. <laughs> like, life, is just, life is just hitting me right now. And I can have that conversation with her. And she is one of my biggest supporters because like regardless of what I do, um, she's she's like, you can do this. Reach out for help. And then another part of it when it comes to the academic aspect of it, I remember taking a class with Dr. Dugan because I saw her. She gave the um, a speech at one of the, um, what is the ceremony that we have for incoming freshmen? Convocation. Convocation. I was, convocation. So I saw her speak at that, at that convocation and I was like, I want to have a class with her. I want to say she was like one of the first black faculty I, I, I noticed on campus. So I was like, I want to have, I, I need to have a class with her. And the next semester I signed up for her sociology class and it was honestly one of my favorite classes ever. And then I was introduced to Dr. Salisbury and it's just, it's having my success, I want to say. And then in my job with do having um, a mentors like Dr. Kegley and Dr. Paladillo, like in different arenas of my, of my um, involvement on campus, I have been surrounded by mentors and administrators and women and just people who are there to help my success, right? And then we have a female president here on campus, Dr. Lesney, who's a very good, like, who's a very student-centered president. So I would say my greatest success, honestly, is being mentored and seeing women in different positions who I can reach out to who I can go to with different problems, different, different questions, and just know that like when it, when it, when worse comes to worse, like they're there to help you. And even mentors and male mentors as well. I have, a, I hope a lot of those, Dr. Wallace, I consider him a mentor, Mike Kwan. So it's, it's surrounding myself with mentors, I think has been one of my greatest, um, one of the things that's pushed me to my greatest success, success here on campus is having people I can turn to um, whenever, <laughs> wherever, because I'm a person who likes to ask questions. I have a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions up here. So, and then my family as well, honestly, like I said, it never, it never, I'm, I, it never ceases. Just the expectation is there. So, yeah. Thank you. I am so glad you all have found, you know, those mentors and, um, people you can go to here at CSUB. And I hope all of the students here watching know that they can reach out to so many people here on campus um, that are here for you. So um, to move on to our next question, do you remember a particular instance where, and not to trigger anyone, but where you felt less than or inferior due to your ethnicity, race, gender, um, whatever it may be? And how, how has that situation helped you grow since then? Um, I kind of wanted to jump in on that because I was so triggered in like the best way by Tiffany Cross and Dr. Salisbury's conversation when you're talking about PTSD and when Tiffany Cross was sharing her experience at CNN, um, I had a similar experience. So before I came to CSUB, I, I guess I'm a non-traditional non student. 
Um, my first time going to school was at a junior college and I really struggled because I was used to being the big fish in a little pond at my high school. And then I got to college and there was other people who were also equally smart. And I was just like, wait, I have to work now. And so, <laughs> um, and so it was an adjustment for me and I felt less than in a particular situation because I was in an honors history course and my professor was telling me that racism was no longer relevant because we had Barack Obama as president. And so he wanted to go toe to toe with me, the only black girl in the room, because like Richard said, when you are the person taking those advanced classes, you are often unfairly called upon to represent everything for the black race or you are silenced and no one wants to hear from the black race because now you are the black race in that one classroom of 30. And so I was telling him, I was like, no, um, just because we have a black president doesn't mean that all of a sudden racism has ended. I, the statement alone makes me feel like this is no longer going that way. And I was, and I felt very unseen and unheard in that moment because when I was trying to explain about things like colorism or the paper bag syndrome that people of color still experience, no matter if you're black or Asian American, like if you are a minority, you are always trying to be the most white adjacent because that's how representation in society has said, like whoever's lighter is gonna be liked more because you look more like Massa who was white. And so it's like trying to go to that scale. However, in a room of 29 other white males, it was not really a conversation they were trying to hear. Um, and so I struggled with that because as a philosophy major, I want to get my PhD in philosophy and I want to make room at a table that normally does not have room for people of color. Um, one of the contemporaries that we learn about in philosophy is Immanuel Kant. And if you know about Kant as a person of color, Kant believed that people who were not white males from Europe were not human. So therefore all of his rules on morality and enlightenment that we learn in our classroom is excluding me as a student because I'm a black woman. And so when you have that kind of dichotomy and you're learning and you're trying to find your way in history and make your own history as well, it becomes very difficult. And that's why I lean on my mentors um, Dr. Marco Burroughs is one of the directors for the Kettle Institute of Ethics here at CSUB, and I count him as one of my mentors because even though he's not a woman, he is a feminist, I would say. And I feel like that's just as important to see um, in this field of, or traditional fields where women are not included or people of color are not included. I feel like it's very important to show that there's still people who are using their privilege and they're not breaking down their fragility, but they're using their privilege to help others. And I feel like that was also really key. Thank you. I, um, I would like to focus on my experience of uh, being hypersexualized because of my race. Um, growing up in high school, even though I went to, I attended a program that was really, uh, woke or they focus a lot on humanities and recognizing race and ethnicities. I was often um, called like the spicy Latina or I would, I have, I don't believe that I have an accent, but sometimes certain words that I say will have like a different stressor. And so people will, people would make fun of me for it. Uh, they would call me like the less hot version of Sofia Vergara. They would make fun of the way that I would talk. Um, sometimes just by my nature, I will say like hola or I'll say adios. And people would tell me that this is not, this is America. You're not supposed to speak that language here. It's just, these are just memories that I have from high school. And me being, you know, the little imposter that I was in that time, I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't know what to say. I'll kind of just take it. Um, in college, an incident that happened with my voice, I, I don't really believe that it was it was motivated by my race, but I talk in a low voice and a man had an older man, like who was probably 50 had told me that I had a very sexy bedroom voice and it was in class and I didn't know what to do. But I, what I told him was that's weird that you said that. And 
the following or the following class period before class, I went to my professor who's professor, Dr. Vega, who I, I want to connect it back to saying like how important it is to see people who are like you in positions of power. Because if you know, Dr. Vega, he is a Latino man. He is an ally, a safe zone ally. And I just felt completely comfortable to tell him this man told me this in class and I do not feel comfortable. And that was the first time that um, somebody encouraged me to take action. He said, let's go to title nine. Let's make a report. We'll make, we'll do anything that we can to make you feel comfortable in the classroom so that you don't feel like you have to leave or you can stay in class. And, um, so that is honestly what helped me grow from situations like that. Having somebody like him tell me like, what you're feeling is valid and it's not okay that somebody talked to you like that or you know like made implications about the way that you are the way that you speak which is just something natural to you and they're just like turning it into this really weird and hypersexualized thing um it's okay for you to feel scared and um anxious and we're gonna do something about it and so that that recognizing my power in situations like that has really helped me grow so that now when people talk to me like that, I can more directly say like, that's not okay. If my girlfriends are going through something or uh, anybody is going through something that where they feel uncomfortable, I feel completely, it's completely in their power to say like, yes, I feel uncomfortable and we can do something about it. It's not okay for people to treat you or talk to you based off of the, like what they think is okay. So that was my experience. I just want to say I'm, I'm really sorry that happened. I this is probably a nonviolent zone, but someone will probably have been knocked out just if that was said to me. But um, I will kind of jump in with the with my. I think mine was um, when I first did move here. It was fifth grade. You know, fifth grade, Yutachi was quiet. She was shy. <clears throat> We're not anymore. Sorry. Um, but she was she was quiet. She was shy. She was like that that kid who wanted to like fit in because in everywhere she she turned to like she didn't really see anyone who looked like her. So then I want I remember I don't know why, but this story is so ingrained in my memory. And I want to say it's it was kind of like a it was a turning point for me. I think later on and kind of has shaped um, my personality a little bit was having moved moved here early fifth grade little kids. God bless your soul. I want to say it's um, lack of education, I would say. But being on the playground, being told, asked by kids, oh, how do you how do you say this in your language? Or do you, in, in Africa, did you live in huts? Or did you have houses? Or were you, like, just, just little questions. And every single day being asked those questions. And then the way that I pronounce words as well, I think, going back to what, uh, Selton, Selton? Did I say that right? Selsin. Selsin. That's fine. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, Just being told that the way you print, I'm saying certain words are not American enough or it's not the right way. So then being corrected every time that I I spoke, not necessarily by like my peers. And I I don't want to say by teachers either, but like being told, like, could you repeat that? Um, Could you like say it a different way? So then me having feeling like I had to um, change the way I spoke, I think, like changed the way I spoke. I had to like, I felt like I had to hide my accent um, when I spoke and the way when I spoke to certain people or when I spoke in an in general in classroom, like I didn't want to, I didn't want to speak out loud because I was like, what if I say a word different and then no one could understand me, blah, 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 blah. So it's sort of at a young age for me, I would say, but just overall, I think that just with the growing up, I've come to appreciate that those things that people saw as different made me unique, I want to say. So then I moving, starting in college, um, I want to say seventh grade, I was just like, we're not taking anything else. We're going to be, we're building that confidence. And it just, I will respectfully tell you to back away. <laughs> um, but I want to say in college as well, I really made it a point to try to speak in my, like, in my African accent, I would say, like, bring it back. Because it was, because when I speak my language, like if I were to go home right now and I speak like I speak my language, I would say I would be made fun of over there <laughs> to because I sound more American than Nigerian. So I made it more of a point to kind of embrace like my accent again, like retraining my brain and retraining the way that I spoke um, to let let just let it feel more natural than force. 
I would say. Um, so I would say when I felt on team was when I was younger, but like that, I feel like that story and just that experience has helped me grow and um, empowered the way that I viewed myself and just put myself in situations and when I, wherever like I find myself. So, yeah. Thank you. I, and I like personally connect to that story so much. Like I said, I'm a Yemeni American and um, although I've been here most of my life, growing up, it was a very distinct, um, you know, I, I am not part of them, but I'm also not a part of my, my full Yemeni community. And so where is that line? Like you're in this parallel where there's this life and there's this life. And how do you merge those and, you know, talk about intersectionality, uh, intersectionality and that framework and all of that. So, uh, thank you for sharing that. But anyone else like to chime in? Um, I also would love to chime in um, with her, like y'all talking about when you were younger, like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. Like all of these memories are coming back to me. Right. Um, when I was younger, like you're, so I was born in America. I don't have a Filipino accent. Um, when you're younger, just based on your features, just based on your color of your skin, you people ask questions and you're quite taught at a young age, you are different. <laughs> you are different. And coming from um, uh, Asian American woman experience, um, you know, you have to go through, even at a young age, you have to go through this hypersexuality, which I'm so sorry that the other women on this call also had to go through. Um, I used to be ashamed to be Filipino because I was a darker shade. Um, I wasn't the right Asian um, and so I was like, oh, I'm Asian, but I'm not Filipino. And so I really had to discount who I was um, and learning later on um, my, my, my culture and how I should be so proud to come from the Philippines has been so empowering. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you, Crystal. Giving you air hugs, Crystal. Um, I also was thinking when they were sharing about their stories of hypersexualization and being younger, I was like, Brittany, like you have like <laughs> how many years of experience with that? And you just like totally blanked. And I was like, that's because PTSD, it's like a trauma trigger. You just like leave it in the past, right? Um, but no, because this is so important to bring it to the forefront because we're on here, but there's also like over a hundred other CSUB students who are watching and non-CSUB students who are watching that are also female. And every time we say something, it's like a barb to their heart to be like, oh my God, someone else had my story. Or, oh my God, I feel seen because she also saw the same experience. And so with that being said, I will share my hypersexualization story. Um, I was 13 and poor Brittany, 13-year-old um, Brittany, she had growing pains and puberty was not her friend. Um, I have been 5'7 since I was 12. Um, and so it was very awkward for me. Um, and I was nicknamed Dolly Parton in high school um, because I like country music and I was also endowed. And so that was something I had to deal with. Um, and it was like a, con like they, it was either Black Dolly Parton or Oreo. Oh God. Like I didn't eat Oreos for a long time, you guys. Um, and the statement for Oreo is because you're black on the outside, white on the inside. However, with that statement being said, you are associating whiteness with education, eloquence, grace, and poise which I had because I'm from Texas. I was Miss Teen Texas, so I definitely had poise and elegance. And my parents also have advanced degrees, so I'm educated. Um, so when I'm being told that the things that make up me for being Brittany are actually not belonging to me because of my skin color, and I'm just a flashover of the white version of myself who owns all these things, that was something that helped, that made me feel unseen. And it also helped me see how different I am from those around me. And then when I was 13, I was told, well, you know all about the birds and the bees, look at you. And I was like, I don't, how does my body shape constitute my knowledge of sexual exploitation or the in inequity that there is for women? Um, and so that was actually from a male in power, um, actually a, pr a principal. I was just going about my business. And that was the other thing. I feel that when you're a person of color, you have to be comfortable with people inv invading your space because they want to. And so I say that I was just going about my day and then they stopped me to share their little two cents, which obviously wasn't worth much. Um, it was actually derogatory, but there's that whole assumption that I believe it stems from 
slavery and 400 years of Black people just being in the room and people talking while we're there. So they assume that it's okay to say whatever they want to say while we're there. Um, I think that that also experience caused him to think it's okay for me to tell her that. The same way that man thought it was okay to say, to Selton, you have a bedroom voice. No one full well, she's going to be your granddaughter, your daughter, you know? And it's just that assumption that, oh, well, you're not someone I empathize with, so then I can just dump on you. And so with that being said, I feel like it's important to have these symposiums because we have to be told multiple times by people who look like us, it's okay to claim your space. It's okay to be like, back up. Like we just said, respectfully back away, you know? Um, and then sometimes like Tiffany Cross says, not so respectfully. I want you to be uncomfortable. And no, I want you to be uncomfortable and to back away from my space. And I feel like that the language and the tools that we need are coming from our mentors and they're coming from people who look like us in positions of power that say, it's okay. Like Dr. Vega was for you. Like, it's okay to say that it's not okay. And I feel like that's why this is so important. I thank Dr. Salisbury for asking me to be on here because Lord knows I can talk. And so I'm just really glad to be on this panel and just say, it's okay to talk and reclaim your time. And that's what I'm going to say. I would like thank to jump you. in. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone who's shared their stories, their memories, their experiences, as it can be um, pretty, you know, not the funnest, most uncomfortable thing to kind of bring up. So I'm so I'm glad we can just create a space right now where we feel safe and vulnerable. Um, so I want to say thank you to everyone and sending you lots of love. Um, I also want to just continue on on like the topic of when you're young and how you become so hyper aware of like your race or just your identity and you, you not necessarily fully understanding what that even is. Um, for like example, something that really just the pivotal point in like my childhood where I be started becoming super hyper aware of like who I was, my identity, uh, my family, my culture was just, um, I grew up in a household where um, we spoke mainly Spanish. And so going out to places, I would have to translate for my mom who only speaks Spanish. And so um, I remember once there was a person who just started being like racist towards us because I was, um, interpreting for her, but I was so young that I necessarily didn't understand the situation, why they were um, being like the, what, like why they were saying the things that they were. And like, from that moment, it manifested into like me hating my culture, me not wanting to speak Spanish anymore, me not wanting to identify as being Latinx or Mexican anymore. Um, and it also, and since then, obviously like you do internal work, you um, unlearn these things and I, you know, I could say I've grown. I love who I am. I embrace myself fully who I am now. And the way that I just, I guess, um, the way I put in the work for it is I just encourage other people, especially youth who are still being, um, who are just still being affected by whiteness, um, by colonial standards. Um, I just try and like tell them that they're beautiful, they're worthy. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. So thank you all for sharing all of those stories um, and your experiences. Um, I know they're very personal, but I, I, I'm so glad that you shared them with, you know, with all of us. I, you know, there were moments where I'm like, yes, I completely, I've experienced that or I understood that. And I'm sure um, our attendees feel the same way. And I wish there were more spaces like this where we all could share um, these stories because I think when we all um, connect and we connect on you know these experiences that we've had it it helps um, others understand who not necessarily haven't gone through them you know they can empathize or they can understand a little bit more so thank you um, I know we're getting a little close to the end so for the last question is what do you have to say to other women of color um, or young women of color who are having trouble finding power in their identity. I'll go ahead and just start. Um, community, at the end of the day, that's really what's gonna help people. It's gonna, what's gonna keep people um, lifted. It's gonna keep people liberated. Um, building community is important. Um, it's ways that we see now the way um, transform, like the way, the world in itself is just transforming because we see that collectiveness, we see the mutual aid, we see the way people are wanting to show up for each other. Um, and so I just, 
I hope that we do continuously create spaces where people can find themselves and um, just be able to fully live their authentic selves without fearing death, without fearing violence, without fearing um, that they're just going to be erased and overlooked. I'd like to hop on and say I'm always a big um, supporter of therapy and counseling and a lot of internal work. And um, the best way to empower yourself is to understand why you don't feel empowered. And a lot of the times it's a lot of internal work. Like what, for for example, we're talking a lot about um, our experiences as children. And so how from day one, (laughs) how have you been oppressed and how have you been told that you've been lesser, whether that be through your your gender, your sexuality, your race, your color, Um, going to to therapy and especially having um, a therapist or a counselor that's um, really knowledgeable about um, intersectionality and um, uh, similar experiences across like, oh, like a lot of immigrant children also go through this or you're, you know, you're the uh, youngest daughter or you're the oldest daughter. What does that mean through uh, generational trauma? There's a lot of things to unpack when it comes to being a woman of color. We go through, we're, we're attacked and we're, we're, um, we go through a lot of trauma every day, whether we realize it or not. And so that internal work is, is one of the best ways, in my opinion, to empower yourself and understand why people do the things they do and why you do the things you do. Yes, I I completely agree with Brianna and Crystal. I love therapy and community is huge. I would say for sure, don't be afraid to ask for help or reach out to people. Like that is so important. I think a lot of people struggle with this, but particularly people of color, because especially children who come from immigrant families where it's like, they're very independent. I came out here, I did on my own. You can do it too. And there's a sense of hyper-independence, which is not always healthy. Um, It's okay to talk to people about your feelings, your thoughts. It's okay to reach out to teachers for help to get a better understanding of what it is that you need and what it is. Yeah. That as Crystal said, makes you feel not empowered. I think it's super important. And yes, just utilize, utilize people that you trust because a lot of the time it can be completely discouraging and you will come across people who even in your own family, will be like, it's not a big deal. Um, you're overreacting. Uh, I've, I've been through worse. So try to find people who are going to be, who you know you can trust. Counselors are always extremely understanding and helpful and just friends that you know are caring and, and thoughtful and considerate of your feelings and validate you as a person. I would say utilize that and and definitely, yeah, follow people who who you feel like represent you and, and are who you want to become. That, that internal work that Crystal was talking about is totally important and nobody's perfect. And that's totally fine. Uh, recognize that and be okay with that. And so that you can become the person that you want to become. Thank you. Anyone? Um, I would say, I would say it just to everyone out there. Um, I have four sisters. So like watching them kind of grow up like it's seeing the life, like life through their eyes and making sure like they have all, everything just so I don't get off track but I would I want to really say it takes time right surround so it really does take time for that internal work to find community to find mentors to get to where you want to go um to feel safe to feel like empowered it takes time and I want to say give yourself that grace give yourself that time give yourself the ability to feel to process it all um, to surround yourself with people, and but most importantly, surround yourself with people who will bring uplift you, and also tell you the hard truth as well. But like in a very good, like in a very constructive way, not someone who's going to tell you the hard truth to bring you down, but surround yourself with someone who's going to empower you and tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Right? Find that community. Find find people who've gone through it who are going through it and who are going to go through it with you because it does take time to get to where you want to go and what you get achieve what you want to achieve but you have to surround yourself with your community you have to surround yourself with mentors um people who look like you even people who don't look like you but if they have something to offer don't be afraid to reach out do not be afraid to reach out that's also another thing do not be afraid to reach out the worst someone could say is no now you move on like you won't, you won't, you won't fade away. I promise. I've tried it. Like you won't fade away. 
Just ask the question and the worst they could say is no. And then you find try to find another person who will help you succeed. But, but be comfortable asking the question. Ask the tough questions. Be your greatest advocate. You are your greatest advocate. And you have to reach out to others. Like people can know of you, um, but you have to reach out to people who you know will be able to help you, who can give you the information that you need. But surround yourself with community. Know that it takes time. Give yourself that grace that you need to do what you need to do and mentors and even your peers can be mentors. I remember meeting Brittany. It was literally really random. And she is one of my closest friends now because we're like, it's like, it's like finding people who relate so much to your situation. So know that everything you're doing takes time and just accept that it takes time and give yourself that grace and like allow yourself to simply be. Because as women, we have a lot of pressure. Like we, we before earlier, we were like double zooming or double, like double, like we're women and we're trying to do it all. You're trying to do it all in every arena. You're trying to find yourself in every arena, every space, but know that it takes time and you have to give yourself that grace. And that's something I have to remind myself every single day, but know that every single one of us on this panel, we're still growing. We're still, we're still, we're still trying to figure out what we're, we want to do. We're finding spaces where we think spaces need to be made, but give yourself that grace and surround yourself with people who will uplift you. That's it. Thank you so much. I just wanted to say I, I got that shout out. Love you too, girl. I love everyone on here. And I um, wanted to say thank you again to Dr. Salisbury and everyone. Um, doc, thank you to Tiffany Cross. Like, oh my God, that was so inspiring. And I honestly just said, um, this Gender Matters Symposium is important because gender matters. Um, we focus so much on trying to fit into the mainstream without acknowledging that the stream that we're in is important because it's different. It's ours. So it's important to talk about gender matters because we're all female and females matter. You know, without us, we would not be here. So thank you all to everyone. Um, and I really enjoyed the conversation today. Thank you so much, Bernie. Thank you to everyone, Dr. I speaking for myself, I am so proud and also so incredibly inspired by all of you. Um, I have been, I don't know why, holding back tears, just listening to all of you just talk and you're such an amazing group of women and um, thank you for being here. But I think our time is up. There is a question in the Q&A for our panelists if you would like to answer it in the chat. Um, feel free I to. I want to jump in on that. Thank you. Um, I knew this panel would be fire. It was nuclear. I am so proud of you guys. My heart is pounding, actually. Um, I thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your stories, your insight. It is important. Um, this is going to get shared with other people that are not here today. I'm going to make sure of it because we got work to do clearly. And it's not being done to reach you guys. Because my motto as a teacher, if you think you can't be taught by students, then you are not an educator. And you guys just laid out some lessons today. And I highly appreciate it. I highly appreciate it. You got my love. You got my support. I am so proud of you guys. Thank you. All right. All right, everyone. We're going to move ahead. I'm going to stay emotional because my sister from another mother is getting ready to join us. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to uh, get my colleague on here. Uh, Dr. Cargill, are you ready? She'll join us in a minute. Okay, here she comes. There she is. Hi. All righty. Sorry, Hi. sorry. No, no problem. Um, uh, welcoming with my colleague, Dr. Ivy Cargill, assistant professor in political science, who's an expert on Black and Latinx voting uh, 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 communities, um, will be joining us with, as I said, one of my most favorite people in the world, my hero, which I will embarrass her, is uh, Rose Clemente. Anywhere I am, she knows she's going to be brought. This is her second visit to CSUB. She knocked it out the park the first time she was here. If you don't know who Rose Clemente is, then you don't know anything about activism. Rose Clemente is a lifelong dedicated activist, um, journalist, and a social commentator. She is an educator. Uh, she is a 
was the vice president, youngest vice presidential candidate in American history um, on the 2008 Green Party ticket with Cynthia McKinney. Uh, she was recently a consultant on the film that most of my students will recognize because uh, I made it an assignment on Judas and the Black Messiah. Uh, she is sharing her time with us today because she is busily finishing up her dissertation because the next time she comes to visit, she will be Dr. Rosa Clemente. So mm -hmm. welcome to my good friend, yeah. Rosa Clemente. Hey, everybody. Thank you. I miss you, Dr. T. I miss you. That's my that's my nickname for you. <laughs> I miss you, too. Um, thank you for having me. So I don't know how this is going to go because um, Dr. Salisbury was like, don't just do like a keynote or whatever. So we're going to have a conversation with you, with me and Ivy. Get to some things. We've had an awesome morning with Tiffany Cross. It looks great. Yeah. And our student panel just blew it up. And we want you to speak from your heart and, and real, because that's what's needed right now at this moment in time in history. Yeah, um, it is It is uh, a crazy time, but it's also, <clears throat> as, as a historian, like I can contextualize all this because all of this has happened before in a different context. Um, you know, I don't know what to say about these times, except first and foremost, um, Anybody that has had COVID or lost a family member, um, we need to figure out a way eventually that people will grieve and be able to mourn these losses. Because when you don't do that, um, and it's just not the African way. <laughs> Let me just say that it's not the way, you know, and of course, all our um, Asian American, <laughs> South Asian folks, Pacific Islanders who have just been under, you know, this horrific white um, terrorism in this country, domestic terrorism. So I think that's important. You know, I'm, I'm, it's interesting. I'm in a place right now of major transitions in my life. And um, a reason for that was I was starting to not like being in movement spaces. Um, I love younger people, but where's the like humbleness in a way to be like, I don't know everything. I'm almost 15. I don't know everything, you know. Um, then the flip side is like this younger generation did something um, so, so incredible. And everybody will say protests. And what I really say is, it's this generation that really has broken um, what um, to be non-binary, um, to embrace your sexuality, your gender, your the person who you are but um, in movement spaces. So that's been really exciting to see that happening. Um, and, you know, I just think right now, if, you know, if people don't understand American capitalism, exceptionalism, they can just look at what's happening to all these kids right now, <laughs> um, being shuffled through this um, draconian and inhumane um, migrant, immigrant, issue that's that that is happening and you know what i'm starting to realize is like a lot of people don't even know that all these human rights are being violated and i think one of the things is we've gotten to a point where all we think about is what's happening here in america and and not understanding like we are part of a global community um and we're a horrible imperialist country that assaults human rights on a daily basis within these borders and outside these borders. So it's, it's to me, you know, what I've been thinking of, Dr. T, I'm like, wait a second. We have this huge human rights crisis, right? Um, and the United Nations defines one of the human, one of our human rights, many of them, is the process of moving and leaving, you know, and, and with the climate catastrophe that is starting to affect island nations and therefore central and what we would call South America at this point. That's another reason. But then the flip side is that, you know, this dude, Derek Chauvin's trial starts today. And I'm like, why is that not 24 hour national news? Like the jury has been seated. It's nine white women. I know how it's probably going to end, you know, and it's not going to end well. Because there's no way I don't I don't believe a jury in Minneapolis of nine white women is going to convict a white cop. I don't see it. We'll see. But we have this kind of inside 
the borderlands and outside the borderlands kind of situation that if people don't read, if people are not engaging in substantial political debates, if people are not coming to the table with a political ideology, um, if people are only coming to the table because they want power, you know, that really speaks to the crisis that we're in. So those were just some of the thoughts I've been having because I've taken myself mostly offline. I have someone that's helping me post. And I realize I've been really happy not being on Twitter and Facebook. Instagram is always a better, better place, you know, um, but I just realized the, also the um, the cruelty of this system and then how people themselves are um, poisoned by it and they're acting in so much hate and and. And lastly, seeing the attacks on people that I consider comrades and sisters, even if I disagree with them on some politics, but seeing the attacks against Tamika Mallory and Patrice Cullors and Melina Abdullah um, Mm -hmm. has been so sexist. And it's the men of our generation, you know, the this hip hop generation, as defined as those of us who were born after 1969 to the 1977, 1978, you know, and I understand everybody in here could be almost three decades younger than I am. So I want to make that clear. The men of my generation, the attacks, the snarkiness, the hate, the judgment, you know, um, made me finally be like, yo, I'm not trying to burn around these dudes no more. Like I put in the work for 25 years, especially within a hip hop context. And I'm done. I'm, I'm this patriarchy misogyny. I'm tired of having to explain to people who should know better and do better, you know? So again, just some thoughts. I hope I put out a lot so that we could. Uh, you, you, you did. I it's like, <laughs> One of the things I want for the for this this young audience we have out here is you are 20, 25 years in the game. And, you know, when I met you back then, you were the only one really talking about your black identity. And people thought that was so controversial. And yeah. now when I see now that it is so much at the forefront, I go, mm, you know, and this violence against women, you talked about that back then. And, and so, you know, how would you recalibrate what we're trying to do for these younger people, because in some ways you're not quitting, you're refocusing where your work is going and you're protecting yourself. So um, for you, how might they recalibrate this? Because, you know, I know there's some tension with the Black Lives Matter and the parents of victims. And I think that's being uh, 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 exploited. That's a, a, a natural conversation to have between those two parties and it's private, but the media is trying to exploit it and make it a crack and it doesn't have to be that. And so how would we recalibrate with young people? How would they get involved in the kind of activism? You know, I tell my students all the time, what you were doing at 19, when they, they're like, you know, oh, I don't know. And I'm scared and this and that. And I said, you know, Rose Clemente was 19 doing some of this work putting herself out there. So what what would you recommend to young people that want to get involved out there and what avenues would you suggest they take? Yeah, I mean, first I I would say young people have to read. You have to read like political, black political theory. You have to know what like black nationalism is, Puerto Rican nationalism, who was the Rainbow Coalition, who are political prisoners. Like, you know, as much as we've been on these Zoom, like in in a year, um, we can see that the other side is winning the the debate game, right? Even though they're crazy QAnon conspiracy. And I started watching the documentary on it, the QAnon, because I was like, see, we also have to study. Um, And we have to be more willing to engage in really tense conversations. (laughs) You know, um, I, I, I do find that the way to recalibrate that is, again, reading, understanding political ideology, understanding like who you're uplifting in an elder or an ancestor. Like, you know, I, I'm always like, why would you be uplifting that person that actually worked against your people just because of a quote identity, you know, kind of thing? Um, second, that 
if you can't organize where you're at, like a lot of times people will say, when I get somewhere, when I get back to my community, communities everywhere. And one of the things is that you have to also learn to be an organizer. Like I don't call myself an activist. I'm an organizer. I don't just sign a petition and and not be fully aware of the situation, not be aware of the people who are um, our forefront leaders and that every community demographically and geographically is like really Really different. Um, how I organize on the East Coast won't work on the West Coast and vice versa, kind of stuff like that. You know, I mean, but at the end, it's also like everything can't be triggering. Like everything can't be about like trauma all the time. Yes, I get that. I really understand that. But we've gotten into this weird like space where we want community but then we want like self care. And I'm like, from what, <laughs> you know, like community <laughs> actually often solves those problems. Right. I understand when young people say, you know, this is triggering or I need, um, I need a safe space. And I'm like, no, you don't because the world is not safe. Like, you can't avoid this stuff, you know, and it is horrible. And a lot of it is traumatic. The way we counter that narrative is by uplifting resistance narratives, by uplifting what people do in an organized fashion, not as an individual who has mad Twitter followings. And part of that is going to require for younger people to literally detox from social media. All of us have to, in a way, detox from social media in, in a way and find out the mechanisms that work for us. But that lastly, as an organizer, like, yo, it's not it's not a, it's not a space for weak folks. You know, you got to go in there and know at any given time, some people might have progressed in your circle. Some people might might have regressed that you are looking things um, at a different lens that might put you in opposition to other people um, who are in community or activists who are saying, well, you know, if we vote this person in, everything will be all right. And it's like, are people not even watching what's happening right now at the border? But not only the border that Joe Biden has already deported more Haitians than Donald Trump did in four years. And that's why people need to study. And that's why people need to read. And that's why people cannot depend on these white men anymore to save us. I'm like, are we really, this is our choice, this dude and Biden? Like to me, it just requires lastly for me to recalibrate was I also had to say, you know, my best work might not be in certain spaces at this moment, um, but that I want to work with young people. Like, I don't want to work with people my generation unless you're already my comrades because people get too stagnant and stuck in their ways. You know, and the reason I made that recalibration and trying to right now is because I just want to work with young folks. Young folks are energetic. Young folks are hopefully more willing to um, listen and to engage, you know? Um, young folks bring the energy. Like I can't be in the streets at 50 the way I used to be, you know? Um, and part of that is when you've done this work, which is why I understand people want to take care of themselves, that, you know, you do this for 25, 30 years and then you wake up one day and like everything health-wise is falling apart. And that happened to me and it's still happening. So I had to make a decision like, where am I most needed right now? You know, what is going to be my contribution right now? And it was, it's not as hard as I thought it was going to be, but I do find myself at moments like, no, I should say something, or I should be in this debate, or I should. And I was like, you don't have to go to every debate or fight that you're, you know, invited to. Um, and I think that just has come with where I'm at age wise, but also. Um, a need, hopefully, for younger people to begin to understand that, like, showing up at a protest is not a movement. We're that doing... nothing is changing in terms of this attack from white supremacy. Yeah, yeah, Rose, because I want to go with that, because, like, um, you know, let let's speak truth to power, because you you know you're you're not a you're not a Democrat, you're not a Republican, you could care less about that. But we need to be honest because our younger generation, it's not that they're not interested in voting. They don't believe in these two political parties with damn good yes. reason. And that, um, 
you know, yeah, we needed to get rid of King Cheeto, Donald Trump, but Joe Biden was nobody's choice. He was a choice of, of, of desperation. Um, there's been some good things, but then there's been some bullshit because he won't forgive student loan debt, which would change the landscape. The yeah. uh, 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 you know, the firing people over light marijuana use, which they got embarrassed on and changed. He's, you know, you got a problem at the border, but I find it interesting that he dropped it in Kamala Harris's lap. He's not taking quite leadership of that. So, Speak to how we young people might seek out alternative remedies. I know we talk about the magical third party and things like that, but speak more to that where you said educate yourself, know stuff, really dig stuff. Because I see people relaxing because Biden is a return to basic competence in government. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. So, yes, I'm not. Um, I don't participate for the most part in the two party system, although in this last election I did. Um, endorse Julian Castro and then Bernie Sanders, you know, and I'm actually thinking of that as a mistake I made. Um, and I'm good with owning that. And I'm actually processing that right now because see what's what, what this election really was, was for the Democrats to win because they want the power. Not necessarily things to change, not things to get better for the majority of people, you know, um, and I don't even really have to speak about the Republican Party. And I tell people, like, can we just not talk about this dude anymore for the most part? Like, but no, mainstream media can't because that's where they make their money, you know, um, but seeing all this corruption um, really like now it's really super blatant um, in, in this way. when. We had the first wave in, in the early 70s of black mayors. You know, I understand why they don't want to teach young people anything about marrying Barry, except that eventually he would be set up smoking crack and still come back and win an election as a city council person. But it, when I looked at the policies of marrying Barry, I'm like, that's why when you go to D.C., you see mad black people working because he was like, I'm appointing every black person who wants to work in a government job. And it was like, all right. And you so you see this first wave of elected officials, then a second wave. And now that this kind of third younger wave. Right. But at the end, nobody has any trust in the two two parties, period. So in a weird way, it's like I can kind of get why Trump people are like that, because some of the things he said, especially about this being a broken political system, was like, that's kind of true. Not why you want it to be true, but there shouldn't be any faith in these institute in the electoral political system. You know, um, look, at the end, we know if it wasn't for black women, we wouldn't be here. We would be here talking about something very different. Um, but look, while Biden and them are doing what they're doing, the Republicans are right now trying to pass the most dr draconian voting measures ever. Like people who studied Jim Crow, they were like, this is going to be worse than Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by that? Georgia where black women and then a whole new group of young electorate, young people, Latinos, Latina, Afro-Latinos, um, um, Haitian immigrants. I mean, Georgia, you can really see the black and brown kind of solidarity on the ground with the electoral political project, but also because there were dope organizers down there that committed to flipping that state and all of, all of that being said. And what is the Republican response? Like they're trying to pass a law that says you can't hand water to people while they're online waiting to vote, that you won't be able to vote after 5 p.m. and all this other stuff. So when young people see this, they're like, yo, what's happening? Like we got the COVID thing. We got the stuff at the border that's happening. We have the internal domestic terrorism, the police terrorism. And now I'm trying to take away or make them the voting rights almost non-existent, you know? And one of the ways to organize around that, I don't think is through the electoral political project. Um, and not everybody has to be always participating in the voting stuff. There's other ways to organize, you know? So I do understand people's frustrations at this point with institutions in general, 
because they've all let us down, including the health medical institutions. And and, and here in New York, I, we're dealing with Cuomo. I live in Albany, New York, right? I live around the mansion. And I'm like, this dude's been corrupt for 10 years. <laughs> Everybody in New York, we were like, why are people falling for what Cuomo is about? Because he was, as you said, Dr. T, competent. So what? All we need is competent, white, mediocre men running everything, still sexually harassing women and still be able to be in power. I wouldn't I don't trust this. So why would young people trust it? But in saying that, then you have to organize your community. You have to find what is you're passionate about, but you have to be very careful of not being seduced by the possibility of an American dream that never existed, but for sure does not exist anymore for anybody. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Cargill, I'm going to have you jump in. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Rosa, for being with us this uh, this morning or afternoon for you uh, in the East Coast. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to have you back with us. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you started at the beginning uh, you are a historian as, as well as an organizer, uh, and you started. You said something that caught my attention in terms of um, how, as a historian, you understand how to contextualize the moment that we are in. I was just wondering if, for those of us that um, are not as as well versed as you, um, for those of us that that aren't familiar with with what that con- that what that con- what that context is, would you be able to provide us? some examples uh, where uh, of how you connect what's happened in the past to what's happening right now? Yeah, I mean, so all my academic work looks within particularly Afro-Black, Latino, Latina, Latinx identity and politics in the United States. But <clears throat> I came through Black studies. So I've been in Black studies my whole academic career or Pan-African studies or Africana studies, right? And you just people just need to see the beginning of the nation to know it was always going to be a failed project. Right. The beginning of America is really. Um, I mean, yes, they want to talk about they won a war against the British Empire, which is which is very real. Um, but really, the, when America is created, you know, it it's created off the genocide and land taking of our indigenous brothers, sisters and non-binary folks predicated on Chinese um, Chinese labor, uh, you know, exploitation, capitalism, the denial of, of equity for women. You know, people be like, well, that's not, it's not all like that. I'm like, did you read the constitution? They didn't even allow their women they were sleeping with. They didn't even, the white founding fathers didn't even see them as equal. So how are they gonna think about the rest of us? And of course the African slave trade, which made the United States with the, the Western world, um, when you talk about power, that's exactly how America has all its power, the enslavement of 400 years, um, enslavement of African people, not only in this country, but throughout the Western hemisphere. So we can like even analyzing what is happening to our Asian um, folks in this country right now, right? Like if you know history, then you know that this country has always treated particularly Chinese folks completely um, within a context of racializing them, right? Um, exploiting their labor, not just Chinese particularly, but the first exclusion act in America around immigration was to exclude Chinese um, migrants, right? And even today, I was listening to some Democratic um one of the um, cabinet appointment appointees, and he, uh, a, a Democrat under Biden and Harris, and he was like, no, like China better best basically stop messing with us or we're going to like over the Uyghur situation, what's going on to Muslim folks in that country. And it's like you threatening China. Do you know, like why China is a global power right now? Like, um, but yet in that, that, that um, xenophobia and racism is putting uh, is is killing people in the streets, particularly the United States, right? So I'm like, yes, this is horrible. Everything that's happened, but it's happened before, and the only way we continue to move forward is when we resist in these ways. But if we don't know the history of resistance to all that, then we don't understand how to be part of something in the current moment. 
So it's like, no, history doesn't repeat itself how people say that, but history will show patterns. So for me, like I'm a visual learner. So for me, I'm like, just give me a timeline and I can always connect that. So, you you know, you want to say reconstruction, 1865, it took 100 years after that in 1965 for the vote, voting rights to be, you know, um, passed kind of thing. So there are these patterns. The overall pattern of the United States government in America is that we exploit people. Again, we're an imperial country that has bases all over the world. And we, sorry, see, these are the helicopters because I told you I live near the governor's mansion. They're trying to see if he's going to come out today. So sorry about the helicopters. <laughs> I, I thought I was in LA for a second. Like, I don't hear helicopters and all that we like that. <laughs> but um, so when I'm feeling like, man, how do we get through this? I just look back at history and I look at how we resisted a lot of that history of oppression, you know, and that again, only organized folks can do that. But that's why I always am telling folks, you got to read y'all. Like, I don't care if you read a, a speech online or a transcript. What I'm saying is that, if you don't have an understanding of how this country was founded, why it continues to operate this way, a lot of things will be confusing and you'll also be like, this will never change because change has happened. Have we progressed? Of course. But what does that mean when you white people always have been progressing because everything favors them, you know? And so that's how I think about it in that way. I yeah, thank up. you for that. I really appreciate. Yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind, if, if I could um, ask a follow up question yeah. to that, which is is related, um, but also to I think is also more so related to the work that you do um, outside of of um, or maybe even within the academy. Um, so some of this. I teach a course, Black and Latino Politics in America. And a lot of the, the I taught it last semester. And so a lot of the conversation obviously was around the racial reckoning that the country was facing. Um, and even within the, the entirety of my classes, um, I've really been trying to, you know, scaffold and 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 uh, bring in all of these, these conversations, whether or not the class is about race or not, because I think races, race and ethnicity and gender are, in, are endemic in our, in our um, understanding of what Amer America is. And so because we are a Latino serving institution, um, I know that I've some to some extent gotten some pushback from some of my Latino, Latina, Latinx students about um, this idea of anti-Blackness, right? So um, you, you know, you, you have a lot of work on this. And so just wondering if you could help us better understand how as an already marginalized community, we can be anti-Black because that is where I think some of our students are, 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 are confused. Like, how can I be racist when I'm also being, you know, people are being racist against me. Like, I, I don't understand that. And so would you, can you help contextualize that for us, especially given, right, knowing that like the Young Lords and the Brown Berets were right there fighting, you know, uh, right next to, not right next with, uh, next to uh, Dr. King. Well, no, not the Brown Berets and the Young Lords. They were not with Dr. King. The Brown Berets and them come after um, the what we the end of the civil rights movement because oh, people. Pardon me. Yes, oh, the, yeah. No, it's okay. Black Panthers. Because people will stop talking about um, um, particularly that that time in history at 1968 when it's the next seven years where we see the most radical organizations, the Black. Um, Panther Party for Self-Defense, the Brown Berets, the Young Lords, the White Patriots, the Weather um, Underground, the American Indian Movement, the Black Liberation Army that Asada comes out of, and Los Macheteros, which were the more radical wing of, if not the most radical wing of the Puerto Rican um, independence movement that we've ever seen. So, um, look, everybody in the world is anti-Black because the whole world is anti-Black. And that's my answer to this, because I have become increasingly frustrated with um, a lot of la like of the conversations around anti-blackness because what has happened is this anti-blackness is being put on the larger 
quote, Latinx community, right? As opposed to being like, who does it benefit to now all of a sudden be like, yeah, the Mexicans super anti-Black or the Dominican sisters super anti-Black and doesn't know she's African or Puerto Ricans don't know that they're Black. Like, you know who's having those conversations for the most part? Academia and neoliberal um, um, white liberals in this country, right? Um, That's to say that every community If you have been brought up in white supremacy, you're going to try to avoid that as much as you can. And for particularly the Latino, Latino, Latinx community of immigrants, except for Puerto Ricans, all of the um, our immigrants or their land was taken like the land grab from from Mexican folks. Right. Like. Who's the enemy right now? Is, is, you know, is me confronting my titi at a dinner and being like, yo, don't say that again. That's real. That's good. That's what we should be doing, whoever we are around. But that Latinx people are not exceptionally anti-Black. And I'm like, again, this is what's been frustrating about this discussion. Um, You know, it's and it's funny how it's taking place in the academy. Right. Because. It's being placed as an opposition, as opposed to being like, yo, who really has the power in this country and why? does making now Latinx super anti-Black, how does that benefit capitalism? You know, that's that's what we have to talk about. Um, because I've known many African-Americans and Haitians and we have all these folks. And I, you could be like, yo, that's some anti-Black shit you just said. Just like my, my daughter has friends who are Asian who have said anti-Asian stuff. We have to be like, yo, you know you're Korean, right? Like you're a black Korean. Like you can't say that about Korean people. Like where did that come from? White supremacy. That comes from colonized lands to colonize minds, right? And also that outside the academy, this identity now of, or this conversation around anti-blackness in the Latinx community, right? First, it always forgets to talk about those like us I don't identify as Latinx, okay? I'm a Black Puerto Rican. Like, I'm not falling into that or the BIPOC or any of this language that we're not creating ourselves. Um, I understand the X ungenders the Spanish language, and I think that is incredibly important. But what is happening, too, is people are now marketing and branding what Afro-Black, Latino, Latina, Latinx looks like. We have departments who are like, we're looking for an Af- or somebody who teaches this and they end up like Harvard did hiring the white man. You can find, you didn't know I was finishing my PhD or like 20 of us or the hundreds of people I know that have been identifying as Afro, Black, Latino, Latina for 40 years. Our movement showed that our individual relationship showed us the community we live next to shows us and that there's always inter-ethnic conflict. But most of our inter-ethnic conflicts does not lead to state violence, right? So again, who does it benefit to put a focus on that than to begin to brand this thing than seeing like white Latinas in the media talking about Afro, Black, Latino, Latina, Latinas. So it's like, we don't exist. We don't have a voice. Um, and I say that as someone who has confronted two really big Hollywood actresses in the last year or three, um, one, Gina Rodriguez, super anti-Black. She should never work again in Hollywood. Eva Longoria made a statement. I came out real quick um, on her statement she made. We were on the phone later that night. And Zoe Zaldana, who took it to a whole dis- different level where you, I'm like, you want to see what anti-Blackness looks like from someone like us? Zoe Zaldana, who's obviously a Black Dominican. She doesn't want to say it, but she is. And the stuff that she was putting out three weeks ago around um, celebrating Dominican Independence Day without knowing why that day even came to be. And that day actually uplifts whiteness in the Dominican Republic because it situates Dominicans as anti-Haitian and vice versa. As, as And then not even looking at the massacre that two Dominican dictators um, um, did against the Haitian community on the borders, right? So all I'm like, I, I like that it's happening, but I also, it comes back to, there were elders who've been doing this work, 
Schomburg told us in 1899 um, who he was as a Black Puerto Rican who amassed the greatest collection of Black history anywhere in the world to someone current like Dr. Maita Moreno Vega and so many others in, um, who are elders who've been very clear that they align themselves with the global Black community, the African diasporic world. You know, so it has been good to see, though, a lot of younger Afro Black Latina women, especially like really embrace and, and trans folks really embracing who they are and also being like, I'm not a fetish. I'm not a marketing tool, you know, um, and the only way we can have better discussions is if we look at the politics of that and how at the end it is um, one of the tenets of white supremacy to divide and conquer us. And lastly, that if we don't look at our shared history of resistance, we might fall into the trap of being like, yeah, that community is anti-Black, you know? If I could stay with it, where you're talking about with the Academy and neoliberals, and quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, all liberals and <laughs> uh, progressives, um, we have this battle over ethnic studies where, you know, particularly California, that we now have a force. We couldn't get them for 50 years. We could not get them to at, at CSUs to add an ethnic studies course. But now it's being forced. But now there's a battle royale over who gets to claim that space. Yeah. And it's also becoming a branding tool for certain schools. But we still have white faculty white neoliberals, white progressives, telling the experts, the faculty of color who've been doing this work underground for years, yeah. what they think ethnic studies is, but in the next breath saying, they don't know who Kimberly Crenshaw is, don't understand intersectionality, don't know what critical race theory is. You know, everything's a war. And so I understand the kind of pulling back you're doing and, you know, trying to refocus with the young people, but how in the hell do we get these people to just shut up and listen and realize that they are not in charge of everything. This institutional power structure just remains in place. I mean, it's been dynamited, it's been cracked, but it doesn't quite all the way fall. So in education, which is going to be the key to young people, how can we, what, how can you think we can move forward, Rosa? Oh yeah, and um, part of where I'm moving is back my foot into into the academy because that's young people for me too, right? Um, and and being able to teach um my class, which would have never happened in New York. Um, it did happen because I had a pre-doctoral fellowship at Cal State LA, and Dr. Melina Abdullah was like, "Come here for a year and create your own class." And I created the first class on Afro, um, Black identity, um you know, in, in the Cal State system, you know, and it's, it's interesting because Dr. Salisbury knows what went down, but um, one of this class was supposed for me was supposed to be cross-listed with Chicano studies and the Chicano studies chair was like, yeah, no, we're not cross-listing that class. And it, and also it's not going to be a graduate symposium because it was going to be undergrad and graduates because the demand was pretty high. And that was like six years ago. Um, and Dr. Abdullah was like, yo, I'm like, yo, I told you, I told Dr. Abdullah, I was like, this is why I've only been in black studies. I've never been in Latino studies, Puerto Rican studies, Chicano studies, because I'm coming from the perspective of race and dealing with that. Um, and that is not um, something people want to really deal with in, in, in these certain academic spaces. Right. But the only way at this moment that academia is going to um, just take the foot off the neck of not only ethnic studies, but black studies um, in general, it's going to be from the young people. Like it, it's got to come from the young folks on the campus organizing and looking at your curriculum and being like, well, how many classes and why is this just a lecturer position or why um, are we not funding 10 full track tenure lines and why are we still hiring professors and not um, putting them through this crazy process of days and weeks of like 
all these, you know, all the meetings and everything you you have to go through and then recruit somebody to come there and then give them no institutional support. So I think it's important for students to also realize that particularly like black and brown women hold these campuses together around race, ethnicity, multicultural fits, all of the diversity and all of that. Right. But we're the first ones that they end up getting rid of. And the only way that stops if it's young people to demand Like if you go buy something nice, you want it to last. I'm just like, if you're investing or going into student debt and you never say anything on your campus and you're just accepting it as a consumer. And I don't see like and and that language does get used. I'm sure um, Ivy and Tracy have heard it before, like been in a meeting where they'll be like, why? Why are the students upset? And you're like. Cause you've been doing this for 25 years, like, or you've been doing, saying the same thing for 10 years. But what they always depend on is that the student leaves, which is fine. You're supposed to graduate. We want you to graduate, but those years that are there, if, um, the support isn't given again, particularly to black and Brown women who hold all these spaces together, um, we have to end up leaving because it causes mental health crisis. That's what it really comes down to. When you're a professor in this way, you already worrying about everyone around you who wants to be better than you, people of color. Then you got to worry about the white folks that say they want to do something but really don't. And then you have to worry about the white folks who really run the campus and the board of trustees. Like there's layers to all of this, you know, and we end up fighting it. And if the young people aren't demanding it, the institution will not change fundamentally, there's no reason there should be any predominantly white campuses in this country because this country is less and less predominantly white. So like even that that term's been created, PWI, you're like, okay. Or if you are Latino um, serving like many of the Cal State systems, then the amount of Latinos that should be there should be the majority and the, the professors and the administrators should mirror the majority. And also not on some merit way, like um, we just did black studies to get here. No, because we're smart and we know how to run things and we know how to multitask and we know what our young people need um, to be able to even succeed in getting a degree. And a lot of that usually is also based on um, a, a lot of emotional labor that black and brown professors have to always give. Like we can't just be a professor, just like our students can't just be a student. Like white students could just go to school. Y'all as younger black and brown, like every day there's some traumatic state violent event. And then three hours later, you have to be in a class that you're the minority in numbers in. It's 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 too much for folks, you know. Um, With that said. Looking at the history of how black studies and ethnic studies started, it's just a legacy right now for y'all to pick up and run with it because it's already been laid out. The departments exist. Students are going back to college next year, Um, but college and universities are going to look real different. They're already doing major cuts in the public system, Cal State, UMass, and SUNY here in New York, city colleges, community colleges. They're all being stripped right now of resources because right now there's a drop. I think they said about 23% drop of African-American Latino students applying to go to college. Why? Because either you lost everybody in your family because of COVID, you're the only one working in your multi-generational family, or you just don't have the money. So it's dropping. And a lot of these college and universities, what they're worried about is the bud- their budgets right now. Every email I get from UMass and Cornell and SUNY as an alum and as a student is, we're about to cut 20 more people. What 20 people are you cutting? The philosophy department with all white <laughs> dudes? Or are you cutting women and gender studies? <laughs> you know, like, what, which who are, I need to know. I want names, I want pictures. Students have to want that too. They have to demand it. Wow, sis, you're bringing it. Dr. Cargill, you're up, and then we're going to move to some student questions. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat. I'll be yeah, sure so given, the questions I could get more of them in. 
Well, thank you so much for everything you're sharing. It's just, it's so powerful. It's hitting so, it's hitting so well. And I am, I'm definitely with you on this idea that our students need to be able to demand more because at least in my experience, it's been the case that if, if the students don't ask for it, if faculty ask for it, it just tends to be ignored. It yeah, It doesn't quite work. Um, but I, I, I was wondering, how could you speak more to, given all of your experience, um, can you speak more to the role of gender in all of this in, in, in regards to um, how to organize and how to get connected? Um, because uh, a lot of our students, I think, and I think even me thinking back to when I was at, at uh, I'm a product of the Cal States as well. And when I was in school, I, I was always excited about these things, but I got to admit, I was always scared. Right. So, and I, and I know that you said earlier that if you're going to be in, in the, if you're going to be a part of, 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 of being an organizer, right? You have to have thick skin um, and you got to be tough. Um, but what would be some entryways in, in doing so? And also too, how do you think gender has played a role in all of this for you? I mean, I'm a black Puerto Rican woman, so it oh, it's always played a role, whether I recognize it or not. I didn't really recognize it until I went to college, but um, I have been recognized in even more within um, the work I used to do within hip hop, the hip hop community. And, and like looking back and being like, did I perpetuate patriarchy when I brought that person on the stage? How did I participate in it? Like, did I stand up for other for the sisters and, and um, other folks that are non-binary? No, not as much as I should have, I think, you know, but um, so for me, that's just part of my identity. It's so like I can't you can't take it away, you know, um, and in recognizing that I also recognize the particular um, issues of black and brown women, particularly like um you know, income and and the fact that, look, there's been five million women that have left the workforce in the last year of this pandemic. More than half of them are black and brown, what people call um, tipped low wage workers. Um, you know, waitressing is the second biggest job for single white women and single black and brown women. Right. So you know, we're talking about 5 million women leaving the workforce. That's impacting black and brown women. Unfortunately, the way it's being talked in the media is that women, when people say women, woman, um, and for those that identify in that way, it defaults to white women and white women, right? So it's like teaching our students about voting or, or I'm sorry, the suffragette movement and not telling them like, then white women did not want black women to vote. <laughs> like they didn't want black people to get the vote. They wanted to get the vote before black men got the vote. Right. So like when everybody last year was celebrating, I'm like black women didn't have the right to vote or La Latina other women until 1968. So I'm like, what are you talking about? A hundred years of suffrage movement, a movement that was racist in itself and a woman that a, a movement that also had the woman who started Planned Parenthood, Mar Margaret Sanger, who basically, if you don't know, but she started Planned Parenthood so that black people wouldn't, uh, black women would not have their reproductive rights respected. So as a woman of color, that's when we talk about this intersectionality, right, that Dr. Crenshaw talks about. But um, being in college in the 90s, you know, I look back at that time and and what I realized was the reason I was more comfortable around men was because I had heard all my life, no matter what space I was in until even after I left, I grad, graduated as an undergrad. I was like, yo, we're as women, we're always told we're each other's like enemy. Right. Like there can't be more than one of us in the room, at the space, at the table and all of that. And that's why I talk about that internalized patriarchy, that people patriarchy is a system that men participate in, but women do, too. So just like there's toxic malehood, there is toxic white womanhood. And I think we know that, like, we don't have to show any more Karen videos to know, like, for the most part, white women um don't have an understanding of who we are and our issues are. And we have to be all right with saying that. And we have to be all right with being in spaces and being like, y'all are talking about all white folks, I'm out. We also have to be in a, able to be like, look, um, white women are the reason Trump got in the first time and the reason he almost won the second time. So white women have their own reckoning to do. 
I'm at a point in my life where I'm like, I've been in those spaces enough times. I'm good. Somebody younger deal with that or like <laughs> somebody younger. I'm just like toxic white womanhood and the tears and the, and I'm like so over it. And it's just like part of it is because I've been around it for 30 years and I'm just like, listen. And, and in me saying that, I've also have people, white women in my life that are anti-imperialist white women, political prisoners that fought for black freedom and were incarcerated um, and used, you want to talk about really using your white privilege? Understand who the weather underground was. Like you want to talk about white women giving up everything, Marilyn Buck, Laura Whitehorn, um, the, um, and other women of that era that were very radical, you know, um, and the white women that exist now that are radical. So for me, I'm like, it's a, it comes also down to like, where are your politics? Because unfortunately, we do have a lot of um, sisters, um, those of, of us that identify as women of color, that we, again, not only internalize the patriarchy, we internalize this thing that we can't be all winning, like that all of us can't achieve something together. And it doesn't have to just be about one of us, you know? I mean, yeah, just telling the truth about um, white womanhood, I think is, is really and critically important of how we see ourselves as women, women of color and that opposition, not to the person themselves, but the opposition to whiteness itself. And we're going to jump in with some student questions because I know oh, yeah. you have to leave to prepare for your next talk. Um, yeah, I could think of wait. I, uh, I mean, I got enough time. We'll do okay. it. Okay. Uh, Teron Bronco asks, how do we get Black males or males in general to understand that women need to be equal, equal leaders in every space in order for us to truly get things done? History shows the greatest and most powerful civilization were where the men and women held leadership roles together. Um. You know, I, I I I believe that there is a younger generation of of men in this country that understand uh, their privilege around that. You know, how do we get? I don't know. And you know, all I know is I could only be who I am at this point in my life, authentic, and not really wanting to be around a lot of spaces dominated by mostly men. You know, because um, I'm like, mm, yeah, I've been to, I'm in those spaces way too long having these kind of same discussions. You know, I think it's a recognition really that manhood itself and how it's framed in this country is super toxic. And that all you can do for some, especially the brothers is be like, yo, this is my experience and my thing. If you roll in like that, like we're not part of a movement. Like you can't tell me black lives matter and then go sexually assault someone. You can't tell me black lives matter and then be at a protest and then the next day, be saying all these disparaging things about particularly like black and brown women. And although there is now this culture of accountability, it's really not accountability. It's more call out and embarrassing, you know, and we have to be real careful on that because particularly young folks will change whether they progress or go a dip in what we think is progress is one thing, but that um, your generation is, is one of the strongest I've seen around that but also has to like be careful that we are not just um, throwing like young brothers away. I'm more talking about like the 50 year old. I'm like, if you are in like that at 50 years old, you're never gonna change. You already know what's up. I might not be able to spend that time with you anymore. <laughs> right. As opposed to working with younger, always like younger folks, younger men and those who identify as men. Okay. Antonio Lopez says, do you think the in institutional inequalities that people of color and marginalized groups face are based uh, due to the hyper-political atmosphere or due to the capitalistic nature of America and the colonial racist views of white America? Uh, the hyper-capitalism. Um, that's, that's where we should all be at now. Understanding everything around race as a construction, ethnicity, and all of that, um, gender identity, all of that's important. Overriding everything is capitalism. And if this pandemic hasn't shown people that this country will literally like let its own people die, as opposed to, you know, saving many more people that we could have saved just based on a functioning kind of government. Um, I don't think you can understand anything we're going through now and not understand that it is all based on on capitalism. And, 
you know, there's this notion that was created in my generation about like black capitalism or like Latino spending power. That don't mean nothing. That does not mean anything in this in this context anymore. We're not talking about boycotting anything anymore because it's it's now we the, the the percentage of like billionaires and Jeff Bezos trillionaire who's really running the whole country, I believe, um, you know, is like you have to understand capitalism and that capitalism is not good. Black capitalism is not good. Latinx capitalism is not good. You know, capitalism needs to go, right? And the socialism that we have some people talking about is not really real socialism. It's just like, can everybody have health care and be able to pay their rent and not be in student loan debt for 30 years? Like, that's what what, what is that demand? It's like a demand of humanity and human rights. And capitalism doesn't square with humanity and human rights. And it never has. I wanted to get in one question because yeah. I think it's just important and it can't skip over is your work with uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, your long term friendship with Fred Hampton Jr. Um, you know, I know a lot of black folks were fussing because they were expecting kind of this biopic um Fred, and it's really on the, the last few years of his life. And as I keep trying to say to Black folks, we could make 10 films on Fred Hampton. Mm -hmm. um, we're telling a specific story of things you guys need to know. And, you know, how do we balance telling this, this young man's beautiful story with the Black pain of how he was murdered? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then what do you hope? Because, you know, Hollywood is another racist institution how had, how did that work out with them and how did you make this change to get this beautiful produced film? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it was a three year struggle. Not a lot of people knew about it. Obviously, um, Dr. T knew about it. I told her as soon as I started working on it, I knew it would be hard. It was all brothers, all good, good brothers, you know, like Ryan Coogler for sure. Um, and it was really the relationship that I had built within this community called Blackout for Human Rights that I have been part of that Ava DuVernay and Ryan Coogler have put together to deal with the water crisis in Flint over eight years ago. And I stayed in it as an organizer and activist. Um, Shaka King reached out to me. He's like, you still connected with Fred? I was like, yeah, we talk, you know, regularly kind of thing. I, I called Fred. It took months before we even got a meeting with him, family, other Panther elders, um, Aku and Jerry, you know, and it was a love, it was a labor of love and struggle, you know, and what I tell people with the movie first, it's a movie, it's the last nine months of his life. Um, it is not a biopic, it is not a documentary, we don't hear enough about Mark Clark, we get some glimpses of the Rainbow Coalition and all of that. You know, um, and there's just going to be some people that even some of my comrades were like, it's still a bad movie. I'm like, yo, I don't really care what, I, what you think at this moment, because I know that we can use this as a teaching tool. Um, for me, the most exciting thing has been is to see particularly like Afro Latino and Black Latinx folks being like, yo. It was just like and this is very Puerto Rican centric, It like you knew Puerto Ricans were part of. Um, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark's world because he had met Chacha Jimenez. But the pride that I've seen in younger people be like, oh, wait, we were working together. And it was like, yeah. And there's a reason why um, Fred had the, the government had to kill him at the age of 21. Like who who at 21 is this country coming after now? Pretty much nobody. That was something. And because they truly believed um, and I think a lot of people knew um, that if, if Fred Hampton had been allowed to live his life, we would be different in a very different world right now. And I mean, a world Reed. second that we were as particularly Puerto Ricans and, and Chicano people in community with each other, but that the state repression would uh, and state violence would be to assassinate him, Mark Clark, want to kill Akua, who was eight and a half months pregnant. She that that assassination happened December 4th. Fred Hampton, the son, was born December 29th. They went in there because they didn't want the baby to be born. Now, Fred Hampton Jr. So I told Fred, what is it that we really want to see concretely? And what it was was saving their house, 
saving the for the house that Fred Hampton Sr. had grown up with. And that's how I went to the table with Ryan Shaka, Charles King. Um, and I was like, listen, we got to save the house, period. Like that has to be an outcome right now. And then we have to keep raising money for the house so it can go through all of the things it needs to go through to be re- rehabbed and be turned into a museum and a cultural center and a, a space um, to grow food for the community. That's their plan. So I tell everybody, go see the Fred Hampton house. Um, they're not taking any more contributions because they've gotten everything, but they are looking for younger people in the future to help volunteer and work for them. And I'm telling everybody too, everybody should try to bring Fred Hampton on and on their show, podcast, or all of that. Because when you see Fred Hampton and you see this little snippet of his dad's life, you see exactly why the government wanted this legacy stopped, but they didn't achieve it. And that's why in that movie, for those who said it, my favorite part, I guess, is like, he says, I'm not going to die from falling. I'm not going to die from falling off a ladder. I'm not going to get hit by a car. When I die, I, it's because I'm dying for the people. I'm dying for the Black liberation, revolution. And he said, Black power to Black people, red power to red people, yellow power to yellow people, white power to white people. Um, and what he meant is that not only do we have to come together and organize, that also that this was an organization that was a socialist organization, that the revolution Fred was talking about was the working class coming together and rising up against the system of American capitalism and imperialism. If he had just stayed within this kind of context of like black civil rights or black power, he wouldn't have been assassinated. Um, And I think that is just big snippets that people could find in the movie. And I agree, there should be like 10 movies on everybody all our elders, right? There should be mad documentaries. Like the last, um, I know I'm coming, they're like already beefing me, but I want to say this, use the movie as a teaching tool. See what part speaks to you. See what's missing in the movie. See who's not in the movie and seek out those people and then uplift their stories or use them for yourself to uplift you. Because what it comes down at the end of the day is that we're alive. But we're alive because of the sacrifices that were made from people that were enslaved all the way to Fred Hampton, all the way to now. And the reason we stay alive is because we continue to resist. We're not going anywhere. So the system is clear. We're not going anywhere. All our all we can do is always fight back. Thank you. That's that's beautiful. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much. And email me, um, Dr. T, give them anything that they need. And I hope to see you soon, sis. I love you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ivy. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. You were amazing as always. Thank you, fam. Take care. All right. Thank you, Dr. Cargyle. I know your busy schedule as well, too. Thank you. Um, I I believe uh, uh, Dr. Dugan uh, uh, is going to join us here in our last session. It, it's it's been a heck of a day. It's gone a lot faster than I thought. And uh, Dr. Noble is is uh, queuing up to join us. Um, and we will be ready to move on to our last panel. There she is. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Great to see you. Hi. Great to see you too. Um, let me get ahead and and first of all introduce uh, my my. Uh, Friend and mentor, Dr. Rhonda Dugan, Associate Professor of Sociology here at CSUB, um, a mad uh, comic book nerd buddy. Uh, uh, so that's when we were last time together again, Black History Month, and we're back together again for Women's History Month. But let's welcome uh, Dr. Sophia Noble, who is an Associate Professor at UCLA in the Department of Information Studies. She holds uh, dual appointments in African-American Studies and Gender Studies. She is the co-founder and co-director of UCLA's Critical for, uh, Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. Um, she has uh, written this awesome book that we will be giving away to some of you lucky students in the audience. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, now this is my autographed copy. This is not my professor copy. So I am very gentle with this one. This is my personally uh, autographed copy. We're going to try to send some book plates to Dr. Noble. So the copies you will get will be uh, uh, semi-autographed too. Um, uh, my teaching copy is in my office. Um, it's an amazing book, Algorithms of Oppression, 
how search engines reinforce racism. So let's give a, a, a welcome to our first time, but we hope a second time guest in future, Dr. Sophia Noble. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here. What an amazing uh, panel session or speaker right before um, Rosa Clemente is just like incredible. I'm so mad that I didn't log in earlier. Um, it's a it's really a thrill to come and talk. And I don't know how we want to set the agenda. Maybe I could just say like a little a few words about sure my work um, for people who aren't familiar with it. And then we can just kick it off and have whatever kind of conversation you want to have. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm sending greetings and I'm here in the Tonga and Gabrielino people's land, um, which has not been seated uh, here in Southern California where I live and work. And um, I want to express, you know, just as I join you today, my um, solidarities with um, our, you know, brothers and sisters who are Asian and Asian American um, being part of um, Black communities, many of us, I think, on this call know what it is to live under the tyranny of white supremacy and racist violence. And so I just want to acknowledge that I know it's a hard time um, in the world right now. I uh, uh, do work indeed at UCLA, and I uh, my work has been primarily concerned for the last decade with what, you know, maybe colloquial colloquially, we think of now as racist and sexist algorithms. Um, I started my work when I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign about 10 years ago, um, studying search engines, studying um, Google in particular, because I was uh, appalled at the way that Black women and girls and uh, Latinas and Asian um, women and girls were profoundly represented by pornography when you did keyword searches on our identities and in our girls' identities. And I was, um, you know, for many years writing about what does it mean to have these large-scale advertising platforms which is what Google search is, just to be crystal clear. It's a large-scale advertising platform. It is not a knowledge portal. It is not a public library. It is um, a system designed to amplify those that pay it the most money. And this is really important, or those that are um, have the skill to kind of gamify the system and optimize uh, content. And so, um, you know, thinking about what does it mean for the future of our communities and the future of knowledge uh, and for our ability to activate powerfully in our communities at a time when, you know, what we think of as kind of every democratic institutional counterweight to racist propaganda and disinformation on the Internet um, is actively being defunded. And so, you know, we see the defunding of education, the defunding of libraries, the defunding of colleges and universities, um, public health, public media, kind of all of the really important um, social uh, counterweights to big tech as an industry. And so my work is really concerned with uh, those dimensions of technology, you know, maybe we, we could think of it as like the political economy of the internet and how it is uh, always kind of working in service of white supremacy or, you know, typically. And, uh, you know, what will we do about it? Um, whether that's regulation or new legal regimes or, um, you know, greater awareness in our communities, um, you know, what are the sites of resistance against these types of technologies. And more importantly, beyond search algorithms, uh, you know, I write about and I think about um, artificial intelligence, which is not the making of the things you see coming out of Hollywood. Um, I mean, AI in a narrow sense, which is the way it's usually used, uh, which is statistical modeling, large scale statistical modeling, which often models us out and um, is used as a sorting mechanism to sort people in and out of opportunities in incredibly opaque ways. And we see this, you know all about this because you know about things like recidivism prediction software where uh, you know uh, defendants are given a score and black defendants in the criminal um, justice system are more likely to be scored as um, a threat. 
um, less likely to be released on bail, all of the kinds of things that are making those processes more opaque and more discriminatory, um, more carceral, right? These kind of the carceral logics of AI, um, what are they doing and how are they reinforcing this kind of imaginary that technology can help us figure out who's good, who's bad, who's in, who's out, um, who should get a mortgage, who should get a loan, who should get admitted to college, um, who should live under constant threat of surveillance, and how uh, is that surveillance used, again, to contain and control the movement of people of color and the um, the opportunities uh, before us. So, uh, maybe that's a, a good longish introduction to my work for those who aren't familiar with it. And um, let me just say, it's like a thrill to get to have these conversations um, with you all because I feel like I've been writing about um, what it means to center Black feminism and critical race theory and kind of our epistemologies in this space where I'm going to, I'm going to say there's probably 12 black PhDs in the whole country in library and information science. I work as an information scientist. Um, and, you know, most of my audiences and the people that I'm talking to are not black people, um, not until very recently. And so it's, uh, uh, and yet our knowledge and the questions we ask and the methods we use are the most, as far as I'm concerned, important ways of thinking about this industry and what these technologies do, because we are, quite frankly, uh, the most likely to be victimized by them. That's awesome. That was a great opening. My my first big question for you, and then my colleague, Dr. Ron Dugan, will be jumping in. My first big question for you is Google, Apple, Facebook are now all getting into the news business. And along with being the search thing, but they seem to have no control, whether it's purposeful or it's out of their control, controlling misinformation. They are monstrously big. Um, they are monstrously racist in their hi hiring. They don't, they're not diverse space workspaces. What would you recommend of how we can tackle this? Uh, because of course this has too much power and money connected to it as well, but how would we tackle this as everyday people, students, consumers, people who might be getting tired of social media? Rosa Clemente was talking about detoxing from social media. How do we attack this problem that seems to be growing uh, as we speak? Yeah, that's such a great question. I mean, I think that it's true that we need to be extremely mindful of what these spaces are doing to document and um preclude us from opportunities. I mean, social media fatigue is a real thing, but, you know, also the um, incredibly narrow framing of success and um, what it means to be influential. Uh, you know, these are, these are tools that socialize sometimes us around some of the, you know, worst impulses. Um, and of course, many of us know um, Black women on social media always trying to kind of use these outlets to speak truth to power, to organize, to resist. And, uh, you know, I look at the research of people like Dr. Tiara Tanksley, who uh, is a assistant professor at the University of Boulder, uh, Colorado at Boulder, and how she studied that Black uh, women report high levels, um, self-reported high levels of PTSD from being in these spaces. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things we need to do to care for ourselves as we're engaging with these technologies. And these technologies are not interested in um, the level of exploitation like that we feel and the harm that we feel at a personal level, but also they're actively um, algorithmically creating space and opportunities for people to organize harm against our communities. So, you know, we can't let Facebook off the hook, for example, for facilitating the organizing of white militias all over the United States, um, for organizing uh, white supremacist mobs um, that took over the Capitol uh, uh, in D.C., 
um, you know, attempted kidnappings of public officials. I mean, um, and of course, also have were active in um, uh, uh, fomenting violence. You know, as Black people were exercising their civil rights and kind of um, responsibility to protest the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, so many people in, in 2020 and, and, and certainly before. So these, these tools are also extensions. And it's interesting to have this conversation around the heels of this uh, of talking about Fred Hampton and the Black Panthers, because one of the things we know is that um, when COINTELPRO, for example, was outlawed, right, when when the federal government came to understand that this secret program was being run by the FBI, it was outlawed. And many of the elements of COINTELPRO were resurrected under the USA Patriot Act post 9-11, which really allowed for um, private companies to do the work that the federal government is limited in doing. So, for example, the things you search for in search engines, that can be given to the state. Uh, things you do in social media, anything, and I try to tell my students this all the time, anything you do on the internet is like, you know, tattooed onto the internet. It's not like you can just erase it easily. So, those become um, mechanisms, kind of uh, extra legal mechanisms these private companies to enact an exact control over our communities in very kind of um, surveillance state co COINTEL pro types of, you know, moves. So we've got to be smart about what we're doing in these spaces, whether it's organizing, whether it's sharing, whether it's, you know, being intimate and vulnerable. I think that um, a lot is at stake when we, uh, you know, are seduced or lured into these kinds of spaces to do that kind of work or to live, um, live more fully. Um, if anything, I think in some ways, and, you know, ask any student who's trying to prepare for the job market, who's trying to scrub their social media account, right? Um, mm -hmm. Look at all of the universities. Harvard, just I think last year, rescinded admission to 10 students because of provocative things that they had posted in their social media. Faculty lose jobs. I mean, there's a lot at stake um, in these spaces. Just to follow up on that, um, I would actually like to explain a little bit what algorithms mean to, for some of the young people in our sure. audience. And sure. Also, um, we're in a pandemic where social media has most definitely benefited from, you know, people's need to stay connected. Do you think we're going to have to uh, deprogram and learn how to reconnect with each other on a human level when we hopefully get everyone vaccinated and can begin to interact again face to face? Well, it's interesting because right before the pandemic, we were fully in the throes of the tech lash, which is really this kind of backlash. People, you know, post 2016 presidential election when Donald Trump was elected, um, the evidence of voter suppression was really coming to the fore. Obviously, the work of Stacey Abrams and so many other grassroots activists around the country who are really making visible how um, voter disenfranchisement was happening. And of course, that included companies like Cambridge Analytica, the big, you know, um, story uh, um, uh, to help us understand psychographic and demographic profiling. You know, it wasn't just preying upon the vulnerabilities and the kind of fragility of communities who um, uh, uh, are susceptible, profoundly susceptible to racist propaganda and disinformation about Black people, but it was also discouraging Black people from voting. And we saw this even again, just in 2020, where you know, influencers are tapped to encourage Black people to not participate in the political process. Well, of course, you know, electoral politics has its limits, but I promise you, um, we need the those laws. We need civil rights laws and protections. I mean, that, that also is something we just can't abandon. So, you know, I think... Um, it's it's important that we remember that, you know, kind of all of those things were happening. And, um, you know, I think, uh, I don't know, maybe that's a, you know, a place to kind of leave it and, 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 you know, open up for some more conversation. Let me also just say, what is an algorithm? An algorithm is really... Um, a set of instructions that you give to a, a computer typically to compute 
um, uh, much like you follow a, a recipe to, you know, f- have a particular outcome. It's like a mathematical formula. Um, if these conditions are present, then compute X, Y, or Z. You could think of like a decision tree, a complex decision tree, right? Where it's like, you know, you start here and then if you, you could pick what A or B, and if you do, you're going to kind of go down a complex set of, you know, questions or formulations that might happen. So these happen in very sophisticated, um, uh, long mathematical formulations, but they're not really anything more than the logics of a programmer or a set of programmers or a big team of, in the case of Google's search, you know, you have hundreds of computer scientists working on a mathematical formulation to compute, but algorithms themselves don't really have any agency they do what you tell them to do, right? How, what you program them to do. And that's a really important because artificial intelligence, people really think has some type of logic, moral logic, right? Some type of agency to, to think better than human beings. Well, of course not. It just, it, it does what it's programmed to do. And um, th- this, of course, re- speaks right back to your concerns, which is when you have an extremely narrow band of uh, the population who's making those decisions and determining those things, who's yeah. training um, algorithms, to, you know, ch- algorithms can also be trained to kind of um, look through data and look for patterns and then use those patterns to better inform, right, to train the kinds of um, logics and moves that they'll make. Um most of the time, that data is also dirty data. It's very limited. It um, is data from the past. And one of the things we want to always remember about um, AI, uh, for the most part, in terms of predictive predictive analytics and, and, and those kinds of technologies, predicting what we want um, or what to choose, those will always be based on data from the past. So this is very important. This is one of the reasons why in the case of like recidivism prediction software and those kinds of um, algorithms, they're using, you know, uh, decades of arrest data, decades of um, of uh, conviction data. I mean, there's lots of different kinds of data that they're using. Well, you know, we all know just because you're arrested doesn't mean you've committed a crime. We also know that some neighborhoods are over-policed, black and brown and poor people's neighborhoods are always um, over-policed. So if you've got the past of over-policing, that is going to be the data that trains a predictive policing algorithm, for example, and it's going to suggest that you go right back to those places where you think, you know, more crime will happen. Um, and and this is why we always predicted the worst of the past into the future with many of these technologies. And these are why we have to understand kind of what's happening and get, you know, get our words, get literate about it. And and one more follow-up question okay. on, on where you're going. Um your book explains the technology and the science, but it also humanizes the people who are affected by it. So how do we do that? Because I'm sure you've got battles with your colleagues and, you know, in the classroom and how we teach people about how to do this. As you said, learn the language. Um, but um, does computer science, does this informational studies focus on racial unrest and the segregation of, of, of this of this arena as well as um, the digital divide that is still growing and showing once again during this pandemic that still everybody doesn't have access to a computer. Everybody doesn't have access to the internet. And this repeatedly still hurts people of color, particularly uh, black and brown women who you focus on directly in your book. Can you speak to that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I wrote this book thinking, first of all, you know, I was the age of many of the students on this um, call when I read when Black Feminist Thought came out um, in 91. I think I read it in 91 or 92. In fact, um, I was a student at Fresno State. My professor was Dr. Sharon Elise, who's a professor at CSU San Marcos, um, uh, an extraordinary Black feminist scholar and teacher. And um, I was thinking about how uh, the things that I had learned when I was a young woman were had stayed with me my whole career, and uh, you know, uh, even before I became an academic when I was in industry. Just really thinking about how so many of the things that are 
um, made right in the world come from studying the people who are most vulnerable. And Black women and girls, we know, could continue to be incredibly vulnerable communities um, in the United States and in, in other places. And so I wrote this book centering Black feminism and our kind of our ways of knowing the, and asking different questions. You know, many books had been written about Google before I wrote this book, but none of them had centered Black women and, and our um, analyses of society. And so I wrote this, you know, book out for kind of, for, for, you know, from that as the epicenter. And also, of course, one of the things we know is that um, intersectionality and critical race theory really help us understand um, structures of power in our society. And I really wanted people to understand these technologies also as structures of power, not just kind of end user, not just like, you know, when you're tapping on the glass, but kind of like, what is it connected to? What are these networks? What are these power structures? Um, for sure, we have people and we're seeing through COVID-19 how many students are disenfranchised from education. I mean, in LA Unified School District, I think the last thing I saw was something like 40% of students in LA Unified School District had not ever even clicked on the link to open up the online homework packet, right? And to start to try to do online school. We have students at UCLA in the UC system too, um, sitting in their cars, trying to take classes on smartphones, uh, trying to get Wi-Fi from Starbucks and, you know, or anywhere that they can get it. Um, so we know that um, that the opportunities that technology affords are unevenly distributed. And we also know the consequences are unevenly distributed. And this is why we really must have these kind of ethnic studies and gender studies um, theories and methods when we study the digital or the technological, because we ask different questions and we write and we center different voices, which is what I really try to do in this book so that we, um, and we link those histories up so that we understand that this harm and exploitation doesn't just happen now in the age of the internet. It's part of a long history of experience and resistance. And so what are the ways that we also reimagine? And this is a really important dimension to me. It's not just talking about the harms, but it's like, how would we reimagine these technologies? What would they be in service of? Um, where would we put the brakes on and put the limits and say some things shouldn't even come into existence because they can only be deployed in ways that will harm us? Um, and what we see on the on the ground is that it's in communities like New York and Detroit in the Bay Area where Black and Latino communities are organizing against facial recognition, um, you know, where people are saying these technologies of surveillance and control, not in our, not in our communities. We're not doing this. And so it's, these are not just academic arguments. These are things where people know I shouldn't have to have my face scanned in order to get into my apartment. What? Um, and the thing that you want to remember is that rich people who work in Silicon Valley, the elite white collar workers, they don't let their kids get on social media and use these technologies. They've got these complex, um, you know, uh, agreements um, and, and NDAs that get signed with nannies where nannies can't take photos of their kids, can't post anything to social media, no screen time. So what does that tell us about the makers not wanting their own children to be ensnared and caught in these systems? So we might also reimagine that our digital divide could be a, a place of protection for us. Mm. It, it it remains to be seen. It remains to be seen. All right. I'm going to have my colleague, Dr. Rhonda Dugan, jump in here. Come on, Dr. Rhonda. Uh, hi, Dr. Noble. Good hi. to meet you. Great you to too. meet you. I'm also a graduate of the U of I system. From hey, Colorado. all so right. Thanks. Nice. Campuses. <laughs> and I'm from downstate Illinois. I saw that in a book. And I'm, I'm further down than Urbana, like more going towards Carbondale. So awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So My I world. just want to say, um, I have so much to say and so little time to say it, but 
I just, and I don't want to come off like a discussant at a conference, but I have all these no, come on. that I just and want to say, say all the things. I want to say you have done, I don't even know the right adjective, how you put this together in this book, these complex um, practices, whether they're micro or macro level, I, just fantastic. I'm, I'm awed by it. And Thank it's you. a wonderful book and I hope everybody um, takes the time to read it. And I appreciate your commentary similar to what you just said in terms of when we hear algorithms and technology, we sort of feel like we can't do anything about it or I'll just let it pass over me because that I don't understand that mathematical stuff. And I think your work has presented that in a way for people like me who don't have that knowledge to be like, hey, I, I yeah, this is understandable. And, and really, we kind of live algorithmically, if I may use that term, in non-mathematical ways. There's a pattern, there's something we do, here's how you do it, like you say, cooking a recipe. So in a way, it's not surprising that these systems of oppression also appear. And I, I the minute I started reading, I loved your term technological redlining. I, I was hooked because we talk about that a lot in sociology. So I, I, right. I love that term. And so you did mention something about facial recognition. I have these questions. Um, and also I ran my own thing last night to see what would pop up. <laughs> so awesome. when I typed in what are why are black people, right? Sort of modeling what you did. It came up, why are black people in Bridgerton? Why are black people called black? Why are black people black post intolerant? And why are black people getting superpowers? So I was just curious to see what would pop <laughs> up on Google. Um, you know, just to see what's what's changed and what has not yeah. right in the work. So I, I couldn't help um in reading about your work, thinking about um the the Eritrean black immigrant scholar. To, I, I always say I don't want to say her name to Tim oh, Tim Tim Nick Tim Jabru. Jabru. Yes, yes, who um who just back in December was fired from Google um for doing her research on AI and ethics. So I was wondering if you could give some perspective on that and how you see your work connecting with her. Experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's true that when for any black woman in academia, that when we try to do our work that is sociological, that is interrogating systems of power, that um, that is typically not popular and, and not well rewarded work. Um, so I think, you know, I'm not unlike, and um, thank you for such lovely things that you said about my work. I mean, I like, I think many black women professors um, experience the kind of marginalization in academia and, you know, all of the things that come with, um, you know, the struggle to work in this field. Um, and get kind of work taken up. Having said that, it really has been remarkable to see, um, you know, my work take a life of its own outside of places like UCLA. So that's been really um, amazing. You know, I think about Tim Neat's work, um, you know, I relate to her. She's like a sister scholar. She's not an academic, but she's a, you know, a PhD in computer science. And here she is, uh, doing her job. Now, this is different than the work that we might do as social scientists or humanists of talking about the kind of, again, the, the like the sociality of these technologies. She's actually looking at, at the code in, you know, large scale kind of natural language processing, um, you know, neural network technology uh, that Google is building and that's foundational to its products. And she says, and this is not the first time that she reports out, hey, we got a problem here because at the level of the code and the way in which we are um, deploying these algorithmically, we have discrimination. There is the, a huge potential for racial discrimination to happen with the with this work. Additionally, she and her collaborators, they're writing a paper because many people in industry who are research scientists also still publish in journals and places where scholars are. Um, she's, she and her collaborators say also there's an environmental dimension of this work. There's an environmental cost because the amount of energy that it takes to run large scale 
um, data models um, and kind of to do the training of large scale data models takes an incredible amount of energy. And she's like, the environmental cost is also profound. And, you know, she's throwing a, a penalty flag, right? She's saying, stop, we're going to have to reimagine or do something different. And, you know, she says to, to her bosses at Google, I cannot continue to work here in good faith if we are not going to work on solving these issues around racist data discrimination. Uh, and they say, okay, great. Thanks. We take your resignation. And she's like, no, I didn't actually, no, that's not actually what I was saying. And they're like, we accept your resignation. And so she's in a legal battle with them now. And they then proceeded to fire another member of her team. And, um, you know, this kind of whole AI and ethics team at Google is incredibly vulnerable right now. Now, here's what it means. It means that for some of us who are in the field broadly of the big umbrella of AI and ethics, some of us are more oriented as social scientists toward justice frameworks, rights-based frameworks, right? We, we invoke civil, human, sovereign rights models to talk about um, the injustice of these technologies. Others are looking at the technology and they're trying to, let's say, perfect or unbias the technology, which I will say is the most conservative and extremely limited position that you can have in the under this umbrella because you can't really, you, you know, distributing harm, you know, is not the same thing as eradicating harm. So we want to be really clear about that. Um, but, you know, her, her firing has been so important because what it's done is it's been a catalyst for... Um, workers, all kinds of tech workers. So she was kind of like the last straw. And then, uh, then thousands of organized people, employees at Google organized and unionized. Um, so, you know, her story is not unlike the Black women who are essential workers delivering for Amazon, who can't get a fair wage, who are complaining about the working conditions of what it means to work for a company like Amazon, you know, richest, one of the richest companies on the planet, mm -hmm. and they can't afford to feed their kids or pay rent. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have those tensions. And I think what you see is that at kind of white collar and working class jobs in the tech sector, Black women also have been really important voices and organizers and responding and speaking truth back to power. Right. And unfortunately, the the highly violent, you know, sexualized violence that she's been a target of as well, you know, in sort of raising those issues is 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 horrifying. So. Uh, another question. If I can, may I go ahead, Dr. Salisbury? Yes, another and then question. we're going to have a uh, crystal range. A uh, student's going to ask a question. Okay, you yeah, I don't want to make sure right. there's enough time for students to talk. Uh, you know, and we start looking at this stuff. We're seeing these racist and sex, you know, racism and sexism permeate through these, you know, search engines and and whatnot. But and, and facial recognition. I had that question, but you you answered that. Is there any way that we can see how these, I guess I always struggle with even just broader than the, the topic of this symposium is the ethical aspect or why do we need to have something? Why does a car have to drive without a driver? You know, all those sorts of things. I, I guess I often struggle to see like, what are some of the, what you think might be positives of, of looking at, you know, algorithms and what they could do for good, especially in the sense of, of organizing or, you know, addressing issues? Like, is there a way that algorithms could be put together in that way? Well, you know, we've yet to see, for example, what it would look like to um, use algorithms to um, redistribute resources mm -hmm. in our societies, right? I mean, that could be a very powerful use of technology to say, where do we have... Um, you know, gross accumulations of wealth or resources that are not, that could be deployed differently, that would save lives, improve the quality of life for the majority of, you know, or for all people on the planet and their inhabit, you know, the inhabitants of the earth. We could ask questions like, could we use these technologies in service of that? And that would be quite amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, we haven't seen that yet because um, the current business model around mm. these largest uh, companies and their use of the technologies is purely extractive. 
taking as much information um, about us. And this is where it, this is where our black studies and gender studies um, and ethnic studies work around understanding, for example, the long histories of colonization and, and mm. um, empire building, right, are really, really valuable as we start to see those same kinds of patterns replicated here uh, of mass, like accumulation, extractive. I mean, Black people, South America and Africa have been prime sources for extractive industries, right? It's where the rich resources are. Well, now we are the extractive product mm. you know we are the the we are being mined we are being data mined um as people mm. and peoples and so this is a really to me so um important about um how will we use these technologies i mean uh some of them are built in ways that require kind of looking for the weakest um uh points to exploit so mm -hmm. those might not be the technologies we can use. I think about that in particular with the mortgage crisis of 2008, mm -hmm. which really started around 2006 when people were started losing their jobs. But you know, the mortgage crisis was triggered in many ways by the gamification, the algorithmic gamification of the financial markets, looking mm -hmm. to see who's most ripe and vulnerable to predatory loans or to the ability to you know, take their houses. Um, who can we bet against so that we can take their houses? And what we learned from that is that the mortgage crisis was the largest wipeout of Black wealth in the history of the United States. Hmm. All the gains of Reconstruction, all the gains of civil rights wiped out. So hmm. the question is, how do these technologies get deployed? And that is, to me, an incredible space of opportunity. Yes, of course, we should be looking at these. But, you know, I think about Angela Davis and her early work when she she wrote this amazing essay about um, about household technology. This was like, you know, at the era of the rise of the dishwasher. And, you know, the dishwasher was this promise to women, right, um, that we would be liberated somehow from um, household work and that this is like an amazing technology, right? You could, I mean, it's such a beautiful <laughs> essay because what it did was not liberate women. It created a higher expectation of, of cleanliness, you know, a higher standard. It just raised the bar. So, you know, it's like we need the systems level analysis like that. And we can look at past technologies to help kind of inform um, the way we think about the future of these technologies too. Great. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Uh, uh, Dr. Noble, I'm going to have Crystal Raines, who is a, a senior in computer science and Wonderful. our reigning first CSU uh, student uh, board of trustee member. She's also wow. just awesome all around and helped kill a panel earlier today. And she's got a few questions for Great. you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Salisbury, for the amazing introduction. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Noble. Hi. Um, this is, an, th your talk and your book and your work have been amazing. My eyes have been opened. Um, you know, in computer science, we're just taught how to execute um, a neural network or how to execute these algorithms that so we're never taught of the ethical impacts of it. Right. And so um, something that I'm really interested in and I want to hear your take on it is how much um, of these algorithms from like Google, from Microsoft, um, from these big tech companies are actually available um, for Congress and their staffers um, to look at? Who can investigate um, the, the, the potential impacts or the impacts that these um, uh, algorithms have? And is the policy solution going to be a national one or an international one? Because um, Google's everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so um, how, how, where do you see the, the work to be solved in or start okay. to? I love it. It's such a great question. All right. So we know right now, um, today, that um, the um, CEO, CEOs of Alphabet, Twitter, and Facebook were, were before Congress, right? And we had another kind of antitrust hearing. These are going to continue. Um, we will see federal level policy. It will either come um, with new laws from Congress or and or it will also come through kind of um, 
uh, regulatory regimes like the Federal Trade Commission or the FCC. So I think those things are happening. There will also be state level, I think, responses. New York is one of the places, for example, um, Tish James, a black woman yes. who is the state attorney general, do not mess with her. At um, all. You know, oh, do not. Okay, so she's also got an eye and a whole team that's looking at things like harm and redress because of course this is another important dimension what if you are harmed right you are precluded you are excluded you're discriminated against you really don't have like laws on the books for you to sue or get redress so there has to be that redress um, element because otherwise there's no repair and there's no restoration and we cannot have regulation without repair and restoration in my opinion so those things are going to hap happen at um, uh, mostly like a federal and state level. Of course, mun municipal governments are also banning, like I mentioned, facial recognition and other kinds of things. We're looking at other kinds of institutions and their use of different kinds of technologies. And so there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, like, what does it mean when Google becomes the backbone of the CSU system or of the UC system, right? So these are places where we want to keep an eye on in our own front yard where we work and live. Um, so those, those questions are being grappled with right now. And of course, one of the big challenges is that, and my colleague Sarah Roberts writes about this, is that the... Um, while there might be some regulation that happens in the United States, companies like Google and Facebook are actively trying to implement their um, extension of power through trade agreements. So trade agreements is a place we're going to have to also watch. And this is, again, to your point, these multinational corporations are interested in um, you know, trade agreements that extend their kind of U.S.-based rights that they can export globally. And of course, the global context is where the rub is too, because Google has to, for example, I'll give you a really clear example. In places like Germany and France, it's against the law to traffic in hate speech um, or anti-Semitism. Against the law. So you're not going to find um, neo-Nazi uh, or Nazi, you know, nods uh, in search uh, on Amazon, on eBay, in these kinds of places, you're going to be able to sell that kind of stuff because there's a there's laws, national laws against that. Um, so Google and Facebook, all the major platforms have to differentiate and do business differently in all the countries around the world where they do business. So you're not going to necessarily be able to regulate that at an international level. There certainly is international cooperation, and there's more and more conversation about that. But I would, I would caution us and remember that this is mostly a matter of kind of the global north organizing and consolidating its interests in relationship to the global south. And I don't have the time to give you a long lecture on this, but I will just uh -huh. tell you that I'm writing now about, you know, the the an, an alternate origin story of the internet, because, you know, the origin story we're, we get is like the, you know, great, great men of computer science, the great white men of computer science for the most part, mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. But, you know, one of the things we want to remember is that the, the internet was really a, a Department of Defense project, right? Under DARPA, you know this, DARPAnet. And one of the things that's really, um, that we, that's less told and this is where the work, again, of people like, um, you know, Vijay Prashad, who wrote this amazing book, The Darker Nations, right, and The Poor Nations. Um, we want to remember that this, the, the internet was about the exchange of scientific information so that governments and, and scientists could do this, mostly as a military project to keep it with the state of the art. And it was intentionally designed to also control the flow of that scientific um, information to the non-aligned movement. The non-aligned movement was organizing all the liberation, you know, all of the countries that were involved in in decolonization, all right, and and liberation movements. This is all over the continent of Africa, um, Cuba, you know, many different um, countries. Who so, if we think about the internet in that way, now we have a really different story about. Um, what these companies are doing in service of, you know, a, a, you know, multiple kinds of, let's say, imperial projects. Um, and I think 
uh, it's distressing, but it's also super interesting and it's important for us to be thinking about. So every country has a different interest. Even France and Germany don't want American companies coming in and setting the, the technological and cultural terms of engagement because those for them are considered, um, you know, uh, military threats. These are threats to their sovereignty as nations. So imagine if you're, you know, not in the EU, what, you know, what the threats might be. Thank you, Dr. Noble. Um, and I would just like to say thank you for all of the work that you do. And I would love to connect with you if you need an intern or anything Call like me. that. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> thank you so much. Hit me up, of course. Now that's going to lead me to her practicing her skills of reaching out for mentorship is I would be loath to not... Um, I'm very proud that today we managed to create a very safe space in a webinar. And so we've been very blessed today to hear from our speakers and our students, very personal stories. And I would love to hear your, a little bit of your story of what you want to share with us. You are one of the few women in the field that you do. You are uh, in the 1% of professors, you know, Black professors who are at Research One institutions. You are amazing. I, I know that'll embarrass you, but I think you're amazing. Um, but you are also a CSU grad. So what would you say to, you know, young students who are struggling with who they are and what direction and what work they're doing right now? And, you know, your experiences as a woman in a in a field that's very narrow for women and women of color. And, you know, how have you worked through tough situations to get where you are now? Because, yeah. of course, it's been a process. It has been a process. And I just want to, you know, say that. Um, I immediately, um, Dr. Salisbury, when you asked me to do this, said yes, because I grew up in Fresno, which is right down the street, as you know, from Bakersfield. I know the, I know the San Joaquin Valley. I mean, my friends and I used to run up and down the 99 all growing up. And I remember what it was like to um, have a strong sense of place in a place like the San Joaquin Valley, where, you know, I knew there were certain sundown towns that I couldn't go to certain parts of town, uh, after dark. Um, I knew when I was growing up, my mom was extremely, uh, persistent about helping me understand how active the clan was in the Valley. I mean, this is not that long ago. This is the eighties and the nineties. So I just want to say that I know that to grow up in the, in the Valley is also to sometimes um, have a sense of like, uh, I don't know, it just, it can feel constricting um, and hard, like a hard place to grow up. And it's a, it's a, like a palpable quality that I think if you don't grow up or you don't live there, it's hard to kind of understand what it's like to be in this space between the Bay Area and LA that, you know, people underestimate and people don't love and don't appreciate and don't respect. And so, um, so, you know, I, I will tell you that for me, it was how do I leave Fresno and try to do something? And I didn't always have a plan. I mean, I'm a working class kid. I'm first gen college. Um, my parents went to community college. Um, and I just tried to take each opportunity, you know, as it came and tried to do my best with each opportunity. So it seems like it's a straight line from there to being a professor at UCLA. But man, it was, it was like, I was a bartender. You know, I did all the things. I worked in retail for years. You know, I worked my way up at the bottom in companies. Um, and then eventually I decided I was 39 and it was time to go back to school. And I got my PhD later in life. I didn't go straight through. I did a lot of Me too. stuff. Yeah. You know, and, um, I think the journey is never over and also where we are when we're 18 or 19 or 24 or 30 is really not the whole story. You know, it's like, um, thank you. I think the, um, it's important to remember that we put a lot of pressure on ourselves especially when we're first gen anything more women of color, you know, to like become. And that process of becoming is a lifelong journey. I still am becoming, even though I occupy this kind of um, elite space professionally, I will say that uh, I still actively face discrimination. I still actively have challenges in the workplace. Um, 
those things don't go away, but of course I'm a lot stronger and I'm ready for it now, yes. you know? And so, you, you know, but all those experiences also strengthen you and get you more and more ready. And, you know, we want to turn the hard times into, um, you know, strength for the next time. And, you know, I guess I would say find a lot of, find, you know, your, your best friends, you know, we laugh a lot. We talk a lot of trash. We, we survive, we thrive. Um, the activism that's in you, you know, it will stay with you for a lifetime if you let it and it's will animate and motivate you, you to make good choices too. Um, and so I'm just, it's like a pleasure and an honor to get to speak with all of you today because, um, you know, this is like, these are the communities that made me into the person that I am. And, you know, it's, uh, uh, um, nothing is ever handed to us as women of color, as people of color, you know, we have to do the work, but, you know, just stay connected to these incredible professors, you know, the way I'm still connected to, I wore my kitchen table press book today, you know, <laughs> uh, the shirt. I love it. Because, you know, I was thinking about reading these books in the nineties and the kitchen table press, you know, this was when, um, you know, Sheree Moraga, Audrey Lord, you know, all of the art, our, our heroes, you know, were like, Hey, academia won't publish our work. It's too much of a space of hostility for women of color who to do, you know, uh, radical feminist work. We're going to make our own press, you know, so sometimes we have to make our own thing and we have to be our own um, legitimators and, you know, and that's okay too. That's okay too. I know I, we are uh, nearly at our close and I'm going to end there because that was beautiful. We started our day this way and you are ending awesome. our day beautifully. And I know you had a presentation earlier today. We greatly appreciate your time. Appreciate you. We hope to have you back in person Anytime. in the future. Thank you. Thank you love so you much. Yeah. I love thank you. Thank you so much. Alrighty, Thanks for including thank me. Thank I appreciate alrighty. you. Call all me, right. stay in touch. Okay. I will. Okay. All right. Bye. Um, everyone. It's been a, a wild, long day. I appreciate you hanging out. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you got a lot of information you didn't have. I hope you got some nourishment, some personal food, some wellness. Um, I appreciate you hanging with us. It's been a long day, but it was a good day. I'm going to ask my panelists just to stay for a little bit. Um, my student panelists, my my grown folks that have a professional job, I know you got to go. Um, a five, um, you stay. Um, we're just going to wrap up, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making this 13th annual gender matter symposium. So successful. I am extremely hyped and psyched, even though I need a nap. So I'm sure you do too, but thank you so much for your support and my participants. <laughs>